to episode 366 of the Saturn Studs podcast. I'm Kurt, joined once again this week by my dispassionate co-hosts, Peter and Jake. That's right, Kurt. I've, I've, I've got nothing inside. Just a, a fucking, I don't know, little pot, little, little, little porcelain bowl <laughs> where my brain would be. It's just fucking, it's a Chia Pet. Um, this week we're coming at you with the, uh, I don't know, Ant Farm Hedge Fund Manager edition of the cast. Let the insects work for you. It is It is very amusing to me because Jake's been playing around with ChatGPT and he just put what ChatGPT uh, wrote for an intro to our show and seeing the complete divergence of what we actually do and what this AI thinks that a podcast that covers the subjects we do should do is is all you need to know about this show. <laughs> yeah. I, as we said before we started, we had a conference on this. We had, a, we had an AI conference. Uh, and we agreed that we could beat Skynet, the three of us, together. That's true. I've seen all the movies. I know how it's done. Which, which is your favorite law of Isaac Asimov's? <laughs> mine's mine's uh, Taco Tuesdays. Okay. So, uh, yeah, it, so it, it, it remembers also prompts, um, which I know isn't that surprising, but I thought I was going to get a new, a fresh uh, answer. So, as mm-hmm. you know, we, we star, we come at you live from a different location. So I said, make up a random place to record a podcast from. And it continued on with the three host bit <laughs> and made a, uh, a conversation between us talking about the, 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 you know, where we're coming at you live. Um, but a- as always, uh, like we did last week, the week before and every other week, we are coming at you live. From a wacky and whimsical world for our podcast, broadcasting live from the mystical treehouse haven. Oh, oh mystical <laughs> treehouse haven. Yeah. Y'all rem- <laughs> yo, side note. Magic treehouse? Yes, magic absolutely. Tree absolutely. Yeah. Don't I even come at me with, do you remember the magic treehouse? How many books did they fucking make? I, I, I stopped reading after they got to, like, I think 20 or something they did like a big christmas themed one that was supposed to be like towards the like the capper and then they just or i thought it was going to be the capper because they had like a very special hardcover release or some shit like that i could have just been stupid because i was very young um Mm -hmm. and i think they kept going i think there was like 40 of them (laughs) jake can you ask chat gpt how many magical treehouse books there are i think it's just magic treehouse we could probably Google that too, but here, uh, can I do a new, new chat? Maybe should I do this? Oh, new chat. Here we go. Um, here, here's many? the real question: Does Chat GPT know what the Saturn Studs podcast is? I'll ask that, that after. Uh, as uh, as of my knowledge. Cut off in September 2021. There were 57 books in the Magic Treehouse series written by Mary Pope Osborne. Wait, you said 67? 57. 57. Yeah. Okay. That's far less impressive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Let's see. Do you know who the Saturn studs are? Thank you. Uh, yeah, totally. <laughs> I know who the Saturn studs are. They're a real rad, chill group of guys who make a podcast about gaming and movies. All right, let me let me see. I'll, I'll so, ask it. Do you know what the Saturn studs podcast is? I feel like there's there's a higher chance. Yeah, maybe maybe it'd be more specific. Yeah. Let's see. I mean, it, it just takes a simple Google search. 
searching for Santa Studs podcast. Yes, the Santa Studs podcast is a le- <laughs> it's just the description I write in the episode. <laughs> it's a weekly romp for the latest happenings in the world of video games, movies, and more. Each week, your hosts, Kurt, Peter, and Jake, engage in engage in entertaining discussions about the latest trailers box office winners and video games you can listen to it on their website or on apple podcasts so it does link our website which is kind of cool oh cool. i'm glad to know that we're part of the uh, that our work is part of the corpus okay so does by which chat gpt is formed um just like this an ai generated trailer in our segment tray watch um my big fat greek wedding three yeah, what a what a strange journey uh this this series has has had from charming indie underdog hit to a uh, soulless corporate sequel. It's really run the gamut of of movies. Yes. I, I fucking I don't know why I feel like Marina Serta should be in this. Um but she's not. Because she probably Just wasn't in the other one. Um, the synopsis is uh, from the from the trailer, uh, the next installment in the franchise. Period. <laughs> they they literally just said it's it's number three, the next yeah. one. Well, <laughs> Peter, the writer strike is going on. They couldn't hire anyone to write a better synopsis. I like to imagine that this was this entire movie was created between the start of the writer's strike. And now, in the last, like, what, two weeks? It's... I mean, yeah, it was Maybe they had... But... <laughs> see, they also might have just had it in the tank. Like, had one in the chamber. Like, all right, as soon as they start picketing, we fucking bust out uh, MB, MBFGW3. When, <laughs> when did the last one come out? Oh, God. Because I feel like it was also... A while ago, or maybe it was a couple years ago. Couple. My big fat Greek wedding two. Like twenty sixteen. So, um, that, fuck that set. What seven years ago? Shit. Uh yes. How? However, however, there was a. Uh, a 14 year gap between the first and second. Ah, there we go. There yeah. it is. I was going to say. Because uh, so it's, it's a experience. sequel to My Big Fat Greek Wedding. My Big Fat Greek Wedding is a unstable radioactive isotope of a movie. And when you're seeing its half life <laughs> grow shorter and shorter each time, this blows a massive hole in my. In three and a half years, My Big Fat Greek Wedding 4 will come out. <laughs> This blows a massive hole in my explanation of like what the average, the normal time span it is in like a trilogy is. Because I was like, oh yeah, the original Star Wars, it was about ten years in between the making of the first one and the the airing of the the third one. The six. Um, <laughs> well, making I'm including like two years of production or whatever, however, whenever it started production. Um, mm-hmm. like I'm like yeah, a three year gap between movies is about normal, and if you add that up like that, that makes sense. Because she was saying how it was crazy; it was a decade since the first Guardians of the Galaxy movie came out, almost a decade. Um, and this blows a massive hole. <laughs> it is uh over two decades. Oh, for this. So this is this say. is kind of a weird situation, right? Because you have the. Uh... The who asked for this way too late late sequel, and then seven years later, that gets a who asked for this way too yeah. late sequel. I think we all know who asked for this. It's, it's Greeks. <laughs> Let's be honest. The Greeks. It's, it's the Greeks. They have been clamoring. They've been rattling their tin cans on their prison cells, saying, "We want more." More wedding, more not, wedding movies. Not since the Everybody Loves Raymond Italy special have we seen such a such a transportation to an exotic land. Tom Hanks was a producer on my big Greek wedding too. Is he Greek? I is don't Hanks, think so. Is Hanks a Greek last name? His character might have been in Elvis. Maybe it was uh, Hanks Kakopia or some of that. Who knows? 
And he's short I'm going to make you a star. <laughs> I'm Tom Hanks. <laughs> well, apparently that's, you know, based on a real dude. Supposedly. Like, I think we did look him Allegedly. up. Allegedly. I think we did look him up and he, he existed. But sadly, uh, we could not locate a recording of his voice. Which, uh, from the sounds of the accent Tom Hanks used, he also <laughs> could not locate. Also could not, yeah. <laughs> And just said, I'm going to get weird with it. I I can't. So I can't tell if this movie is telling us go to Greece or or stay far away from it. It's saying Greece is nice, but having a Greek family is a little crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but isn't isn't that what uh, what Greece is full of? It's a fuck ton of Greek but families. But they're not your Greek <laughs> family. Oh, okay. You don't have to deal with them. You're not Couldn't responsible for Jake. them. Get get a non Greek family. Go to Greece. Have a great time. That's what I did. It was it was yeah. an all right time. I ate Makes very sense. good in Greece. I will say the food hey. is really good. Mm-hmm. Get um, some Slovaki. Get some pita. You know. It is still some gyro. They haven't. Well, they hadn't as of, and I I can't imagine with COVID that their economic outlook improved terribly much in the intervening years. But they still hadn't recovered from their financial collapse of 2010, and like it's really depressing to be in Athens and see all these like condemned buildings with graffiti all over them. It's like fucking Detroit, but <laughs> far more historic. <laughs> maybe maybe this is like the, the, the stage two of their three stage plan on economic reform, economic recovery is No, it's uh, gotta be stage three. Because it's it's the third it's the third movie. Well, this no, is, well, this no, is, they got a prop- no. This movie is what their plan is. The Greek yeah, government is betting, Greece. betting all like government employee pensions on this right now. They really need yeah. this one to work out. They they threw every last penny, every last whatever Greek penny they have. Uh, they threw it at this problem. <laughs> I believe they're and, on the euro. Uh, whatever it is, you much know, to the chagrin of weird, everyone else on the euro. <laughs> you know, some random Greek shilling that they have. Uh, Greek peso. <laughs> because as we all know, e- you know Greece is like EU's Mexico um, and they're just like alright, we gotta get people mean? to get <laughs> <laughs> avocados from Greece <laughs> yeah. the EU just keeps them around because they're a great exporter of olives they're just like oh, we can't lose our olives man, come on olives and, and cork you know, yeah. tree dandruff. Dude, is that where cork is? Cork come from there too? That in Spain, I think it's yeah. main, mainly Spain in the rain. Because oh, um, cork is just—it's like shag carpeting on a tree. And yeah, like you the literally bark. go up and you kind of like—you don't even peel it off because it's so loose. You just kind of like well, grab it. You do kind of have to cut it off. You just have to be careful. I watched a thing about this a while ago. Cork is like revered as. I mean, it's a very um, in-demand item, and they have to remove it from the trees uh, very carefully. Otherwise, they'll kill the trees, and they won't grow back more cork. Uh, Early May to late August, so during the summer, cork can be separated from the tree without causing permanent damage. The tree reaches 25 to 30 years of age and is about 24 about 24 inches, oh, 60 centimeters in circumference. The cork can be removed for the first time. However, the you, first harvest almost I, always produces poor quality or virgin cork. Virgin cork. <laughs> Versus you gotta the pop, chad. The ch- you gotta, pop, <laughs> you gotta cork. pop that cork tree cherry, man, you know? That's what I've been saying all my life. I mean, no one's first time is great. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I get it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, it, it's stuff like that that uh, you know I've always been fascinated by, like how it's uh, imagine, imagine how it's profitable. How how they're like, ah, oh, this is a good product to stake my life's business on. Something right. we can only harvest for like three months, and we could kill our our trees forever. Imagine, like, first you're living in the land of of Spanish, you know, especially European Spanish, one of the more beautiful languages on this planet Earth, and then they name you Cork. <laughs> um, and then these guys who have since named you Cork come in and take your skin off and say it's not ne- never good enough the first time. We'll wait for it to come back, <laughs> then we'll uh, then we'll take your skin off again. 
I don't know. I actually don't know which one's worse. Um, I like to think of it as more like a a lizard that's like peeling, you know, like it it feels good when they get that off or like a sheep sheep that gets shorn and it's like, but then they got to put blankets around the tree because they (laughs) got to keep warm. (laughs) And um, maybe that's, maybe that's what's causing people to die in Barcelona in Bird Box, Barcelona. They made bird boxes out of cork. If you hey. if you planted the seed with the the European Spanish there intentionally, kudos, my my man, kudos. Uh yeah. Speaking of sequels, no one fucking asked know. for. <laughs> yeah. Bird yeah, Box fucking... Barcelona. Looks like it's the same thing, but it's in Barcelona now. We're gonna go all so around the world. With a Spanish with, accent, yeah. With bird boxes bird box for everyone can't wait for bird box south korea yeah, yeah they even have yeah, here they're gonna cross there. over with squid game <laughs> yeah. this is yeah. i i don't know why they're i mean i get why they're making a new one because obviously the 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 first one was they're gangbusters <laughs> i guess it was right. well the, the first one was very popular it's hard to know how popular because Netflix is like, no, can't let them know. Yeah, it was watched a lot, but wasn't that like during the very early pandemic, or was that before? Yeah, that? it was like at the right at the start in Jan- it was in January. Yeah, and it it spawned like some bird box challenges where kids would kids would just walk around streets like with blindfolds mm-hmm. on and drive cars with blindfolds on. It was real cool. Um, so now they're coming out with the second one. I don't think it's gonna have that much of an impact. As the, like the first one did because that was, I think the the cast was also a lot, a lot bigger. It had a, uh, um, fuck, what's her name? I want to say Jennifer Aniston, but it is not her. <laughs> not even uh, close. No, 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 no. It's the other, uh, elder white lady. Um. <laughs> oh, I know who you're talking about. She she just had the movie. She just had like the romance uh, action. I, I know who it is, not, but I'm not, not going to help you. <laughs> not your email George. counterpart to George Clooney. I have Google in front of me. Fuck, I can just ask ChatGPT who it was. Yeah. <laughs> Sandra Bullcock. Okay, there we go. <laughs> there uh... you go. <laughs> Although uh, you were taking so long, I was starting to doubt myself. I'm like, was it Sandra Bullock or was that the other actress that kind of looks a little bit like Sandra Bullock? <laughs> <laughs> There's so many that look like her. Or Anne, I guess Anne Hathaway <laughs> would be would be the the younger looking Sandra Bullock. Yeah. Um, so there we have it. Sandra yeah, Bullock so... does not return for Bird Box Barcelona. How could she? Hey, it's in another continent. Hey, you don't know that for sure, man. <laughs> if if they somehow do, I mean, that was a nice little story wrapped up. They put a bow on it. They're like, she find a little deaf school or some shit. She, she finds a bird box. <laughs> what was what was it? You couldn't see. You could. You, you yeah, you can't I'd like never watch things. bird. It's box. like an incomprehensible horror that drives you insane. Okay, so yeah, they find a blind school. That's what it was. They find a, a school in the woods for the blind, and they're the ones that are like going to retake the world. So, yeah. but nope, we've got Mario Casasasasasasasas. I think it's Casas. That's me, Mario Houses. As as you see, the name is Casa with an S on it. So, Casa. Hey, be I careful, prefer... Mario. Be I careful, Bird Box. Nintendo might Casas, sue you. That's Nintendo IP. He's got to be careful. I don't name Mario. As much as they have tried, I don't think Nintendo has the rights to the name Mario. Don't don't underestimate Mario and Nintendogs. They'll get you. It's just it's just Chris Pratt and Mario costume, and it's driving everyone insane in Barcelona. Speaking Um, of Chris Pratt, he's definitely not starring (laughs) in this next movie, uh, the Meg Two, the Trench. Yeah. yeah. This is so another it's Jason Satham. Another sequel to a movie that we covered in the early days of this podcast. Yeah. Um they're back around. 
they are really taking notes from the success of the sci-fi channel original movies uh that were fantastic um Beloved and they're just punching it up such a as bit. primal force mansquito that's one <laughs> Primal Force is a great one, first of all. I know, you made uh, us watch it. <laughs> uh, you know, yeah, the, it, yeah, it always... Lake Placid was more the, one of the more mainstream ones. That, Wait, that was that a sci-fi? Played, that wasn't a sci-fi. It was played on, on sci-fi a lot, but I think it then became sci-fi channel original when they came out with the second, third, fourth, and fifth. Lake um, Placid, even Placider. <laughs> you know, but you had great ones like Sharktopus and like Shark versus Croc. And shark versus croc versus giant octopus. Um, we can talk about shark movies all day, but like we know that the one true shark movie has come out. It's big shark. It's already there, and we are we are waiting on a special occasion. Yes, we're waiting. Maybe I think Kurt and I are waiting to review that one for when Jake has to handle his big shark, <laughs> Meta, his metaphorical big shark. <laughs> My child. <laughs> yes. <laughs> When that big shark comes out, I'm gonna have my hands full. Joey Big Shark Vito. <laughs> Joey Big Shark. That would be a great nickname, though. Yeah, we're we're building the legend. We're as planting we the seed. Yeah. <laughs> Kristen just told me he's gonna be a star. Apparently, the the news was at her work, and uh, I don't know. Maybe she'll maybe she'll give early birth live on air. <laughs> I, no, is that I something you want? Action delivery. <laughs> I, I don't want that. <laughs> I like I like routine. Let's let's keep it to the plan. coming in hot. <laughs> hot tots. And here we are at Kristen's vagina giving birth. You have anything to say? Ah. <laughs> so if any of you out there listening wonder, does Jake's wife watch the show? The answer is no, because he would never say that <laughs> if she did. <laughs> I'll tell her to watch this one. <laughs> She'll tune in. <laughs> in a, in a, about three months, do you guys mind recording uh, on a whim if we have to? <laughs> we we have we have the potential. I think Big Shark deserves all of us. But I I did promise the last time you were out that the next time that you were out, Peter and I could review the Transformers animated movie from 1980. <laughs> yeah. Oh shit. That's a, yeah, maybe Unicron's a more fitting metaphor. <laughs> um, you know, and, or maybe Jake will just go back on the strip. Is this a sequel? I, this, is... I, this feels like a sequel or like a, re, a, a soft reboot. Black Magic Mike? I don't, I, this movie feels weird. Like it, I, I was watching this trailer and I was like, this isn't a real movie. This is a 30 Rock bit that I don't remember. Yeah. Like he's I don't I don't understand this movie. I don't understand what the the appeal is supposed to be. They got a lot of famous black actors in it and uh it's it it's is a not, thing. It is it is strangely enough an original movie. It is not like a soft reboot. Yeah. Because I, I feel like I feel like we would have heard about this, but it does sound like this was a soft reboot of a movie that never existed, like a comedy from the eighties about all these, you know, it, a lot of these same actors, and it was them like forming the like an all black Chippendales act. Yeah. Yeah, this is so strange. It's like getting the getting the gang back together, but also to strip. Well, I mean, <laughs> and, I guess that's what you know. That's where the title comes from. They're yeah. back on the strip game, and but they're all and they're it also, also in, takes Vegas. Place in Vegas. Yeah, yeah. You see, it's it's so. it works on multiple levels. Yeah, it's clever. I, I like it. It's a clever movie. A clever, clever movie. Right, um, I need to see. This is from Luminosity Entertainment, um, which is is a thing. I don't know. I've never heard of them. Oh yes, it is a black Chippendales because there's a poster in the thing uh, called Chocolate Chips. Yeah, that's the name of their group. Is the, the so chocolate. I guess in this yeah in this universe there was a yeah okay cool yeah. red the um 
Yeah, Luminosity Entertainment. They are on such notable movies as Verona Spies, Steel Soldiers, The Mystery of Casa Matuzita, and Plaza Catedral. So this is seems like a Amazing. departure from their their previous efforts. I guess. This is their this is their breakout move. Yeah. Um Okay. So it's Wesley Snipes getting a movie. He's gotta hey, got pay take... back the <laughs> Uncle Sam. <laughs> <laughs> anytime anytime we can get Wesley Snipes doing some some off the wall shit. Yeah, you got Wesley Snipes and you got JB Smooth in there, so it, it'll be good for a laugh or two, even if it does like fucking reek of zero effort. Wayans brother shovelware comedy. Yeah, the um, XX movies the, of the world. Quickly on the other end of that. Um, we, we talked about a lot of AI. This movie looks like it was generated by AI. Thank you. Uh, poor things. Yeah. It's as if AI meets Wes Anderson. I wouldn't say Wes Anderson. I mean, maybe for the, 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 the block colors and stylization. Yeah. But like the actual filming is like like a fisheye tech. They're using a lot of fisheye for this. There's a lot of fisheye. Um, but I will, I will say this for this teaser. Um it gave me one of my favorite moments in trailers ever. I think it's going to live in my memory like uh, Mel Gibson screaming, give me back my son in the trailer for Ransom or Mm -hmm. Harrison Ford saying, get off my plane in the trailer for Air Force One. And that's Mark Ruffalo post being smacked, looking around very confused and going, oh, (laughs) in a very posh (laughs) British accent. (laughs) Yeah, Mark Ruffalo, I feel like, is going to steal the show. It's starring Emma Stone, um, but the facial expressions on the Ruffalinator, um, and I give it five Mark Ruffalos. You know this movie's going to be weird as shit, because Willem Dafoe's in it. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Not only is he Willem Dafoe, but Willem Dafoe, before putting makeup on, <laughs> he has the scars that he incurred Willem during Dafoe. the first... Yeah, his Willem Deformed, which <laughs> that's his villain alias from the first uh, Spider-Man movie when the the Goblin Mobile crashed Oops. into his face and, uh, and sliced him to ribbons. My favorite Spider-Man villain, Goblin Mode. <laughs> yeah. His, I'm going to go Goblin Mode goblin all mode. on you guys. <laughs> when he went Goblin Mode... I can't mode wait for Spider-Man. Craven the Hunter, the movie. Well, that's coming. That's coming. He's gonna crave all over everybody. <laughs> it's apparently in the Andrew Garfield universe too. I, yeah, I yeah. look, look, I Jake. Sony doesn't even know what the fuck they're doing. <laughs> Don't try to parse it. Just all enjoy, I know is just enjoy across the Spider Verse when it comes out, and don't think too hard about anything. <laughs> they need a tie-in with Crave cereal. The cereal that should not be able to call itself a cereal. <laughs> it's just chocolate. It is. It is fucking tiny eclairs that you eat for breakfast. Yeah, yeah, not true. It's very, and it's super expensive and comes in a tiny ass box. Oh yeah. I mean, it's also ninety five percent sugar. So yeah, because like... they literally said, you know, that cheap product wheat <laughs> that we can make all our cereal out of. What if we? Don't make it mostly out of that. What if we use, we use almost more none of that? Chocolate instead. <laughs> it's so expensive because of the marketing and the profits, you know? Let's, I'll, you know, fuck the inflation calculator. What's, I'm going to measure the market index by the price of crave. <laughs> how many, how many craves how much, on the dollar? Oh my, yeah, no, they're going in. What is it? Oh, is this a 32 ounce? Uh, was this a little bag of crave? <laughs> this does not look like a thing that comes in. Okay, it's little little dime bag, little crave. dime bags of crave <laughs> for uh, yeah, for seven bucks. A, yeah, a seventeen ounce yeah seventeen ounce box, um, five dollars. Yeah, but is that the is that the biggest bulk you can get? What what if you bought it in bulk? Uh, 
What if you bought the 35 ounce from Food Service Direct? The fucking feed sack of Crave. <laughs> so 35 ounce, four per pack, $67. Yep. Doesn't even come in it doesn't even come in Crave packaging. It's just Kellogg's generic yeah. packaging. <laughs> yep. Uh, here are the uh, the the pros: cereal made with chocolate filling, zero grams trans fat, zero milligrams of cholesterol, contains milk, soy, and wheat, whole I... grain certified, kosher dairy certified, thirty four ounce or almost a thousand grams each, and four bags per pack. What in the good fuck is this? You could just about get four thousand. Oh, it has a kosher stamp too, with little oy vey. <laughs> Little Jewish boys can eat crave. Wow. Boy. Or or they can have double chocolate brownie batter crave when you've just given up everything. Should I, should I get this? Look for this that makes involved? Oreo cereal look like a fucking uh, raisin bran. I I feel like a like a big ass boomer whenever I go to like Walmart, walk down the cereal aisle, and I see powdered donut, you know, nutter butter. Um, Donatos. Yeah, and just it's like just treats in cereal form, and I'm like, where was this when I was a child? <laughs> we had no, we were too late for Quisp, but we had Cookie Crisp, and we also had Honeycomb cereal. Cookie you know, crisp. the one with the met with the raving insane mascot with the yes. meth head. <laughs> yeah, I remember. Yeah, the <laughs> meth head. your body and turns you into one, like fucking. Um, the the program from the Matrix. I always want to call him Mr. Anderson, but that's what he calls Neo because <laughs> Neo is Mr. Anderson. Um, I believe he's a Smith. Yes, Mr. Smith, Agent the, Smith, yeah. or something like Agent that. Agent Smith. Um, yeah. Before we sound like too much of a boomer and and just like, what's the deal with Oreo or cereals? Speaking we didn't have boomers. Oreos. I feel like we've we've crossed that threshold. Yeah. Speaking of boomers, Oppenheimer, the biggest boomer of them all, <laughs> arguably. Yeah. Uh, yeah. New trailer dropped, and uh, people are trading like an MCU trailer. Bomb and, dropped. Uh, the, the the a lot of people were excited to see that Albert Einstein is going to make an appearance. Uh, I hope they don't mess up his origin story and they just do exactly what they did in the comics, bring him over into this and let that play out. You know, maybe put a little E equals MC squared on his suit. Everybody be happy. It's Albert Einstein, the guy. Um, He's just a guy. On the topic of... um geniuses i've i've fallen down a bit of a rabbit hole here okay so i'm i was looking into procuring a release of big shark i have thus far been unsuccessful in my efforts so i went to see if maybe like april 1st was like its festival date or something like that and it's got a theatrical release date coming and the only information at the end of the trailer is BigSharkMovie.com. So naturally, I go to visit BigSharkMovie.com. And follow you. Um, it redirects to TommyWazo.com, which uh, I will now show for the video audience, is this. <laughs> it is a clothing store um, <laughs> with, with many pictures Just... of... Undergarments for sale. Uh, TW tank tops, which feature two young men, one of which who is barely wearing a tank top. <laughs> okay, but a three pack of TW boxers, red, blue, and black for $17, not a bad deal. Boys, if you're looking for something cheap for my birthday, <laughs> you want the Princess Penelope watch? <laughs> yes, with the little the, the $50. <laughs> no, definitely, definitely luxury watch with Tommy Wiseau on it. What what has me rolling is the free mask with any purchase. Awesome sale! Yeah, everything's oh, on this, sale. It would seem you're tearing me apart. This, Lisa, this fucking sure. blue jacket. 
which is the most ridiculous color of blue. If I weren't so uh, terrified of having like my credit card information stolen, I would maybe buy something off of this site. But they oh, offer PayPal. Kurt, holy crap. <laughs> I got to get you a super football watch for ladies. Super football watch. <laughs> it's just, it's got little footballs in it. It's got little footballs in it. I like how there's a banner at the bottom of just tits. <laughs> Man knows how it's just bra, a bra, a, a headless bra, just the upper boob of a of a bra, broad woman. White sexy unisex jacket, free mask, Black Friday sale, dollar sign, still up, still apparently in stock, still nineteen ninety nine, marked down from sixty nine ninety nine. So they only have men's underwear. Yes. Yes. That's upsetting. They and they don't have anything from Best Fiends. Nothing commemorating commemorating oh, here's there. Here's all the women ladies. Why, why do they have an entire watch section? That like that baffles me. Yeah. They he must have gotten hooked up with some some apparel company and they're like here's what we can offer you so if you believe tommy was the way he amassed his fortune was in the clothing business of he, course that's what he's gonna say he apparently imported and sold jeans and he did have and like in the disaster artist the book uh greg talks about how he was able to find like businesses a business called fashion uh, street fashions usa or something like that, um, mm-hmm. registered in his name. So there's there's at least some truth to that he was in the garment industry. Um, but yes, there's a lot of <laughs> the Tommy Wiseau. Like, there's a like, dumbbell for briefs. Yeah, the little tiny briefs, and like I love the fucking picture they used to advertise this. So the video, watch this episode on video if you can because you're missing a lot of are you talking about the chrome purple crotch torso mannequin i'm talking about the little tiny um like p-string boxers the sports briefs uh which are laid out with a mannequin that has a uh unnecessarily large bulge (laughs) And yes. that's wearing the red ones, and you have the, the black and the blue beside it. And in the centerpiece is a copy little... of the room <laughs> that's not actually there. It's been photoshopped in. Yeah, so it's not to scale. Like, <laughs> they just want you to be associated with it. Just bring that into your head when you're thinking of the Tommy Wiseau sexy underwear. And this fucking picture of Tommy Wiseau in the corner of the website is either Haunting definitely me. not him or from the 1930s when he was young. <laughs> yeah, this is this has been excellent, Kurt. Yes. Thank you for this taking it. This is a good find. I this am, is a good find. I'm so fuck happy. Christopher Nolan. To have, I'm fuck to Oppenheimer. I'm, no, I'm excited to see Oppenheimer, but it will not compare to the ma- majesty that I have just seen. <laughs> Could Tommy Wiseau please do a biopic? I don't care who. Yeah. Oh, oh, okay. You want to buy a pick that he directs. <laughs> yes, and and stars in. Okay, but not of Tommy Wiseau. No. I want the Vanilla Ice biopic done by Tommy Wiseau. <laughs> well, Stranger Things Have Happened. Fred Durst Stop. directed John Travolta. Listen. <laughs> Ice is back with a brand new invention. <laughs> <laughs> beautiful um yeah i think i made so i made this joke about oppenheimer before i think but you know christopher a lot of christopher nolan movies revolve around one piece of uh near future almost believable tech whether it's but somehow fantastical whether it's going into someone's dreams or what if you could move through time backwards or what if there was a really big bomb that just exploded Oh, you missed out on Interstellar, which I think had probably the most fantastical plot contrivance. 
I forget what the what the tech in that movie was. Well, I mean, it was basically it was all fucking you know rockets and shit. But at some point, he's able to travel back and he transcends our our three dimensional plane of existence into oh the space time continuum into yeah. like a room full of yarn where he can then be a ghost because gravity is love or something like that <laughs> powerful stuff i i you know what i'll i'll be fr- I'll, I'll be freely admit um i never watched interstellar it's it's a rough one to get through um it's it's pretty sad like if Dude. i had kids i don't know that i'd be able to watch that movie yeah. is there do they at any point go uh, hydrofoiling on a yacht? No, surprisingly not. In <laughs> fact, it was even though they go to a water planet, though, right? Uh, no. Yeah. What? Oh well. Yeah. Uh, well, they think it's going to be a water planet, but it there's a lot of water, and they land, and they're like, "Oh yeah, this isn't that deep, and it's um, it's just that low tide." But yeah, yeah they have to like go recover. I think a ship. Those are oh, rounds. that's right. Those that's are right. waves. I, I, uh... Robot. I do recall that scene now. Yeah. I, I had, like I said, took me a, a couple tries to get through it. I thought it was okay. It, was, it's not a bad movie. I'm not. There, there that. was a lot of um, like stuff put into the fact that like the way they did space travel and time dilation and gravity and all that jazz was like really accurate, and the visuals were really nice. Um, so there's that aspect of it. Then there's the aspect that, like, okay, let's get down to the meat and potatoes of the movie, and it's just like, well, this is kind of bizarre and, like, out there, because then they get into, like, fourth dimension, yeah. and, like, I heard I heard somebody explain where, like, the ending of it is actually he he died, like, the main character died, um, and the ending is just him playing what he's dreaming of. In his final moments, which is a lot better of a way to look at the ending to it, to be honest. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes, the the character secretly died. Uh, ending. What an original fan theory. Yeah, uh, but there's a lot of people who also just think it could it could be the other way, where he did he did survive somehow. Yeah, I would I would think it's probably the latter. But the one thing I do like about that movie is that uh, in this near future Earth, like we all dried up and it's kind of like the the dust bowl again um and they actually got to play you know the people the older people who lived on earth at this time uh they got dust bowl survivors and they sat them down and talked just had them talk about what it was like in the dust bowl and they used those interviews as you know the citizens of earth at that time it's pretty neat yeah nifty Yep. So that was Oppenheimer. Um, <laughs> By way of TommyWizzo.com. <laughs> um, and I think that's, I mean, that's most of it. I guess there was another Spider-Verse trailer. Um, but like you said, Kurt, it's not adding too much more. Yeah, we're we're locked in at this point. We know pretty much what we know before the movie. And now it's just a matter of waiting for the damn thing to come out. Yep. And every every week seems a little bit longer <laughs> as we get closer. Yeah, what are, what are we at? When is it when does it drop? June second. Red. And I would I would say, but I'm gonna go see it in previews. And unless there's a Wednesday night preview, that's probably not gonna happen because yeah. <laughs> June first is a Thursday and <laughs> that's when we do the show. <laughs> big brains yeah although i suppose if we want we could record a different time eh, whatever <laughs> time time is a time is a flat circle or some don't, shit like that don't show them too much of the sausage yeah that's true i got in no, trouble it's, for that. we're gonna turn this into a full-on behind the scenes stream i got i got in trouble for that one <laughs> <laughs> all right let's move on to the follow-up where we take a look at the box office Winners and losers for Domestic Weekend 18 of 2023, covering May 7th, May 5th to 7th. Um, opening in first, the movie we're reviewing this week, uh, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, making a tidy $118 million. Uh, scant 
100 million dollars ahead of your second place competition yeah <laughs> yep it's 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 a big movie yeah. i think i think that's a an okay opening it's, um it's a pretty respectable opening i mean it i think for the quality of it it's probably a little under i think it was actually a pretty good movie so maybe the word of mouth is going to get around and maybe the the drop off week to week is not going to be that good or not going to be as drastic as mm. other ones we've seen we'll see i you mean, know because I'm kind of relatively tough because to it's a it's the third installment in a in a series in a portion of in a time for Marvel where they're like really deep in the catalog. Well, that's why I'm I'm waiting for like word of mouth to get around and and people See, to I'm, be like, I'm oh, interesting. I, I I wonder how much word of mouth is going to carry because Guardians is is generally thought of as being more like. For, for the younger audience. Um, and this movie... Might scar some children. Might scar some children and, you know, might not... Like, there's a lot more language in it. Like, I can see parents being like, eh, maybe we don't take the kids to this on the recommendations well, or, or the recountings of their friends. There already has been that. Um, maybe Maybe it's more the fact that People took their kids to go see it, thinking it was going to be, you know, Ant Man Quantumania, and it wasn't Ant Man Quantumania. It was more like, "Hey, this is PG thirteen. We're going to like get away with. We're going to go. We're going to use all that's allowed or that's allocated to us for a PG thirteen movie. Like this was Marvel's first PG thirteen. This is Marvel's first f bomb. They're allowed to show a certain amount of blood, like real, like." Red blood, I guess. It's just weird to blood. Uh, Red blood separate blood. like blood because it. That's like a common trope all the time. Is that you know they can get away with gore as long as it's an alien. Yeah, and it's blue, you know, or but, a machine. That's how they did. But when you, sh- but when you show a character getting shot and then they're like bleeding and you got blood out, red blood all over their hands, it's like oh shit, that's a a little bit more traumatizing. So. We'll jump into it a little bit more. I don't know. I, I've just had a lot of people who've like asked if I've if I've gone and seen it, and they've heard it's good, it's better, and you know they they they're kind of like they're on the fence about going to see it. So I wonder if it's going to tip more people into seeing it the second week or or after yeah. release. Yeah, we'll, we'll we'll get into it more, but I I I am detecting a divergence of an opinion about this movie. Um, the king has been knocked off of his throne. Yeah. The Mario throne. Mario has uh, has lost his power up. See you guys. Just like I said. <laughs> 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 fucking weak sauce. I knew it. I knew it coming out couldn't of the fucking game. Fucking make it. Couldn't couldn't make it six weeks. Wow. In number one. In oh, the sad, middle sad. of the summer. <laughs> Uh, one point one six five billion dollars for the Super Mario Bros. movie after taking an additional eighteen point five five in its fifth week, um, but it left three hundred theaters. So clearly, people are tiring of it. People are over up. Mario. Uh, Evil Dead Rise continues to be a nice little profit machine for Warner Brothers, raking in another five point eight million bringing its total worldwide gross to 116 almost 117 million off of more like evil dead sink i think it was like a 10 million dollar budget or something like that fucking plummets uh topples out of the box office are you there god it's me margaret (laughs) No, nobody's here, Margaret. Falls no, into here. fourth. Uh, $3.245 million, down 51.8% week over week. Uh, only a domestic release thus far, so worldwide gross sitting at $13.68 million. Which brings us to Love Again, uh, which opened... This is the other movie that opened this week, <laughs> or last week. <laughs> you might not have... Might not have heard of that one, <laughs> but this is actually a uh, a trailer we reviewed on the show, as as many of these are, but this one in particular. Mm-hmm. Um, 
is being Which called out as such because it is our spotlight film this week. Yes. Um, we're we're going to spot that light. We're going to light that spot. I don't know. I was, we work on multiple levels. It's a very complex sort of operation where we'll review a trailer and then the movie that that trailer is advertising comes out and we'll also talk about that. Yeah, that that happens so rarely on the show. It's I think I think the French auteur is called this persistence of vision. <laughs> follow follow through. Um, but love um, again. Love again. Has little is, love. So for those of you who don't recall, uh, this is the movie about uh, I think her boyfriend. It's a rom com, and I believe her boyfriend passes away or fiance. And uh, she sends a series of romantic texts to his old cell phone number, not realizing, hey, they sometimes repurpose those things. <laughs> and uh, some dude has it, and he just kind of, like, slides into her <laughs> fiancé's <pay> role. <laughs> just fucking cucks him I'm, from beyond I'm the grave. I'm you now. <laughs> um, and people, people aren't are too keen on this movie it wouldn't seem uh 5.9 out of 10 on imdb 25 percent critics score on rotten tomatoes 0. 0.5 out of 4 from slant magazine i love the random third uh <laughs> review yeah. site google always brings who, who up it's not metacritic scale out of four um a lot of newspapers actually have star scales that top out at four i remember that that's so weird and if you so for everyone who was all up in arms about fucking Mario movies audience score versus the critic score or whatever, um, I'd like to introduce you to this little tidbit here. Love Again has a 28% fresh rating on 25 reviews from critics. as a 92% audience score. <laughs> like, they don't Oh, wow. allow the bad reviews through for audience scores audience scores if the audience score is below 90 you know you have a steaming pile of shit on your hands yeah it's uh it's a little biased that way like 80 i i the 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 the, la, the lowest one actually oh yeah evil dead rise only has a 77 audience score interesting but again, the verified ratings thing is is kind of a crock of shit. They, it gives them carte blanche to purge any reviews they don't want on their site for whatever reason. So you know this could naturally create a weird conflict of interest where someone could offer Rotten Tomatoes web administrators a, uh, a certain amount of money <laughs> <laughs> to set the audience score at a certain level. So they could then advertise that on their trailers to drive additional week revenue, but uh, no, who, no, no studio would ever stoop to those lows. What? Who would have that kind of money, though? That'd be an insane amount of money, and and certainly you wouldn't expect that out of, uh, you know, famous actress Priyanka Chopra, Jonas, <laughs> and Celine Dion. <laughs> in her first acting role i think uh oh i mean outside of maybe canadian television <laughs> so saline, saline, saline dawn saline dawn has actress credits in 130 movies that i okay <laughs> they put her songs in some movies uh yeah, I think this is a little skewed, though. There seems like there are different versions of movies as well that they're including. Um, the numbers. Oh, a lot of the movies are, like, concert movies. <laughs> yeah, they are. That's weird. Okay. They're, they're almost all concert movies. Yeah, they're, yeah, they said, yeah, they're classified as music video. What the fuck? Okay. Oh, okay, so they're just music videos of her songs. So she's made a lot of music. Oh, Muppets Most Wanted, Piggy Fairy Godmother. Yeah, okay. Uh, was she in Titanic? I know she did the the song for Titanic. I doubt she was in Titanic. 
to 10 X. Yeah. Weird why IMDb classifies actress credits in music videos. Well, I mean, it's an acting gig. <sighs> Granted, it does seem a little, uh, <laughs> but it's, it's weird to say famous actress, Celine Dion. If, if you're yeah, like if it's your, the music video for your song. Yeah. It's kind of a little weird. <laughs> But anyway, none of this anyway. is love again. I wonder, how, uh, I wonder what casting was like for that music video. Real, you know? real reviewers. You always talk about real movies. Real reviewers, by real reviewers. Are, are breaking down the door to have their voices heard. And the one forum, aside from the one that they're posting in, where their work goes <laughs> recognized. Reviewers such as uh, John... Oh nine eight nine. Yes, the name's John. John oh nine eight nine. Yeah, that's that's um. Uh, the MI six has gone through a lot of agents. They're they're running up the numbers. Uh, he gave a ten out of ten review for Love Again. Absolutely loved it. Let's face it: if you're going to a theater expecting to watching. Expecting to watching a Sophie's Choice, then this is not your cup of tea. Also, if you're going to the theaters hoping to watch an artsy movie, then this is not what you're looking for. <laughs> this movie really? is strictly for people that love all those rom-coms in the 90s and aughts. You know, those extra cheesy example, uh, which is written out as EX colon. A walk to remember, comma, etc. <laughs> Just the one. Just the one. Just the one. Exactly. It's the one they had. One example. <laughs> There's walk to remember and no other examples. <laughs> I thought the movie was great. I had certain expectations and all were fulfilled. I went in thinking of it, thinking of it would be, of it would be a love rom com, which was is there. A different kind of rom-com? Brain damage again. I think the cast was great, especially Priyanka. I think she did a great job. Celine was amazing as well. She's on a first-name basis with all these actors, or he's on a first-name basis, rather. Um, Sam was good, too. <laughs> it's a simple story. A little boring in the middle, but overall, a good rom-com. Again, this was a 10 out of 10 review. <laughs> Which somehow seven out of twelve found helpful. Powerful. That is that is a shocking conversion rate. All right, I'm gonna try to read this as similarly to Desmond. So just uh, try to look at that picture. Well, not picture, but the, the put the image in your head of Desmond. I, I offered the link there. So boring, I almost died. I literally kept waiting for something to happen. The story was so dead that watching paint dry is more entertaining. The acting was average. The story was poor. Yes, rom-coms are formulaic, but this was a rom dep Romance, <laughs> depression, hmm. <laughs> I regret having wasted my money and time and would highly recommend that if you want to see it, just wait for it to come on streaming channel. The sad part is that I was actually excited to watch this, but I was miserably let down by the poor storyline. Who the fuck is driving by it? <laughs> With, like... Classic. Classic suburban suburban drivers. Love love suburban Formula F one <laughs> racing. I we I think we drove past a couple of those guys the other earlier this week, Kurt, where they were just they had like they they cut their mufflers off or whatever to put the cherry bombs in, yeah. and they were going a hot twenty miles an hour. <laughs> <laughs> what are you pulling me over, officer? I did not. <laughs> Sorry, uh, back to this. Um, but I was miserably let down by the poor storyline, the average acting, and the almost depressingly 
repetitive, moping, crying, sad story of the main character whining about her dead boyfriend. 11 out of 24 found this helpful. That's not at all. Uh, yeah. Interesting. <laughs> Your mic's the class that sounds an awful lot like John Carmack. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, um, uh, John Carmack, the programmer of Doom, not Alistair Carmack, Dean of the School oh. of Engineering. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying I to never heard John me. Carmack speak. Um, it's very robotic. He, he sounds like Jake's impression. It's, it's of, very robotic, and he often ends sentences with. Mm. I mean, that doesn't surprise me. He is a, he is an advanced uh, artificial life form. <laughs> Come here from the from beyond the galaxy to help us to uplift if uplift us into the new age. Like <laughs> me, I'm uplifted. Uh, just like our next very very <laughs> human reviewer, uh, YFXPDYBTPP, uh, with their three out of, of ten review. Uh, love to hate it, but I hated loving it. <laughs> And it's in, in the form of a list. Um, one, I will support Sam Hitton in everything he does, including a, ro- a rom-com with Priyanka Chopra. Two, I went into this movie with le- very little expectations, and yet somehow it both underwhelmed and overwhelmed all of them. Three, there are a few genu- genuinely clever scenes that largely depend on creative cameos. Four, the script is so bad, so spectacularly bad, that you have to enjoy just how bad it truly is. There were many moments that were not intended to be funny, but me and my friends ended up crying from laughter. Five, it's worth a watch. If you are looking for a get you in the feels, immerse yourself in romance kind of movie, I'm not sure this is it. But if you want to enjoy a movie that is fun to watch, go for it. And six, uh, I would like to reaffor- reaffirm that Sam Lynn uh, can do no wrong in my eyes, despite lack, despite my lackluster review of this movie. Six out of eighteen found that one helpful. Well, at least he has a fan. <laughs> if, if Sam Lynn has ten fans, <laughs> I'm one of them. <laughs> if uh, Sam, if, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I read. From the book of C. Gerard. I see Gerard. Chapter 33, verse 079. <laughs> Which one is that fire to? 2420. <laughs> loved Love Again. <laughs> I loved Love Again. It was sweet and cheesy and adorable and funny and everything I want on a rom-com. Including relish. (laughs) Damn those critics who think they're so sophisticated that they can't enjoy a feel-good story that's wholesome and has a happy ending. I mean, it's a rom-com, right? We know going in what the formula is. So it's about the executive, I believe they meant execution. (laughs) And this story was executed perfectly. (laughs) And if this doesn't put Sam Huyen... (laughs) <laughs> to the attention of the Hollywood star makers, there's no hope. <laughs> he was brilliant. Perfect comedic timing. Priyanka Chopra Jones is a gorgeous and relatable, and her sister Sam's co workers and Celine added great color and commentary. I wish I could see it again right away, and we'll go next week if it's still playing. <laughs> Five out of nine found that helpful. I decided right. this was a Jiminy Glick review at the end there. Terrible movie. And oh, it's lousy Priyanka's again. Eye rolling emoji. Um, so that, that'll happen a couple times. One out of ten. Dead boring script. Awful acting and a lot of makeup on her. She can't <laughs> She can't be seen without it, seems. <laughs> Why so this? much makeup, even? Okay, I'm going to have to... 
um, I also need to include how many exclamations there are. <laughs> okay. So there was one, there was two already. Dead boring script exclamation with spaces uh, not properly positioned, but whatever. <laughs> uh, she can't be seen without it, it seems. Exclamation mark. What were we all, what were all the surgeries for? Question exclamation. I rolling emoji. I was literally forced to watch this rubbish by by a friend who's whose girlfriend GF just loves romantic movies and even she found it to be pathetic exclamation mark no intelligent person will like this trash and no one who really wants a good story and reasonable acting uh, would pick a movie with Priyanka's in it I feel weird saying Priyanka's like multiple <laughs> chopras with priyanka's in it exclamation maybe those bollywood movie lovers but not for hollywood exclamation no way exclamation her expressions and overacting is honestly overbearing and that kid husband of hers is in this too that's all i needed <laughs> shake my head exclamation mark not going to be watching anything with her in it ever again. Two exclamation marks. Twice is enough. And both times I was left beyond disappointed. Watch this at your own peril. Exclamation <laughs> mark. Three out of nine. Found I I do enjoy the fact that like overacting is probably just the bar. <laughs> acting yeah. in yeah. Bollywood. If you come up in Bollywood, that's just you know that is acting. Apparently, yeah. she was in Raw One. Oh, I. Which is a sure. movie that I've heard of. <laughs> it exists. Yeah. Um, and then finally, from from our other very human reviewer, um, NNFCQWFJJ. <laughs> Love again. Seven out of ten. Good. I was not expecting more than good. <laughs> I adore Sam and will happily go and see anything he is in. I enjoyed this film more than I thought I would. It, it was a very average rom-com. A little more comedy would have been nice. <laughs> but overall, it has earned its place. I have reviewed much worse and much better films over the years. I loved seeing Selena Dion. I am a hopeless romantic and adore her songs and voice. Sam and Priyanka have great chemistry and the side characters were well developed. An overall nice film. Nothing exciting, just a Sunday afternoon film with a happy ending and a couple of pretty stars and good songs to enjoy along the way. One out of one. Yeah. Uh... A little bastion of Sam, except for except for Selena Dion. Sam Huan seems to have a lot of fans for a guy who's been in very little. Well, I guess okay, he's on a TV show that I suppose is popular. What's the name of the TV show? Outlander. Okay, I haven't I haven't heard of it. I haven't heard I of it. Thought it was gonna be one of these like CW teen dramas that has like the ridiculous following. No, not really. So he's he's got twenty six credits. And uh, among them include uh, luminary credits such as the voice of Mirror Master in Lego DC Super Villains, the video game. Amazing, powerful, grandiose. Uh, young Alexander the Great back in 2010 when he was probably... Okay, he was 30 in 2010. He's not that young. Yeah, not, not a whole lot here. So interesting um, that he has such a passionate following. He just Outlander really must be fun. real popular <laughs> with a He's certain just the sect. total hunk, guys. Alrighty, back He's back to the friends. grind. Yep. In six in its seventh week, uh, John Wick Chapter Four, two point three million dollars down, another fifty one point seven percent. A lot of movies dropping fifty one percent week over week. Uh, John Wick 4 has secured its bag, baby, $406.8 million. Mm -hmm. um, Dungeons & Dragons Honor Among Thieves, uh, now available for purchase on digital. Um, 
is feeling the effects of that as it has been jettisoned from nearly a thousand theaters. Um, bringing Get out of here. a it's paltry, movie time. a paltry one point four million dollars in its sixth week. Um, two hundred two million dollars oh. worldwide, and I know, I know, I personally know quite a few people who are like. Yeah, I wasn't gonna go out to the theaters to see it, but I'll I'll see it when it's available on like on demand. So I think this movie is gonna have a nice little back end uh in home video yeah. sale. It better. I don't know why I don't know why I don't know why I felt the need to threaten you Dutch and Dragon's honor among thieves. <laughs> Didn't want to bring that hostility to this sort of interaction. Uh Air finds itself in eighth. Um, never really got into a bunch of theaters, but uh, leaving them at a pretty good clip there. I have 770. Uh, 1.39 million dollars uh, weekly take for air. Um, 85 million dollar worldwide gross. Not not too bad. Um, The Covenant, Guy Ritchie's The Covenant finds itself in ninth, down 65.6%. Big oof. Already leaving theaters. 824 theaters jettisoning it out. Um, and it peaked at like 2,300 theaters. Um, Just couldn't find its spot. And made a, a not so so lucrative $15.7 million. So here we were thinking this was going to be the, the more lucrative film out of the two Guy Ritchie movies we got this year. We were blessed with two. And they entered in a world that was not ready for them. Just could have, we could have just put them together. <laughs> Done twice as well. And rounding and, out the top ten is Sisu. Yep, just hanging, hanging out in tenth life, love, living life, love and love, being Finnish. Dropping. Right? Uh, yeah, I think he was Finnish or something yeah. like that. Um. Yep. Lapland. I don't know if that's Laya in Lapland Finland. Um, or Swiss. I don't, I don't know. I wonder if this doesn't have a slow roll too or not. I don't know if this is in 1,000 theaters. I don't think it's going to open it anymore. Yeah. <laughs> I think this is a, a small release movie. They're only releasing it in markets where they think it's going to do okay. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. Shout out to... Uh, Quantum Mania, with its, they did a re-release, I guess, like a very small re-release. I think probably just for, probably for like drive-ins, so you could do a double feature with Guardians. Yeah. Oh yeah. That would make sense, or other theaters that do double features. But it's always fun. It's always fun to see it in twelfth last week at thirty-five. Yeah, up six thousand. Didn't didn't even pull in a pull in a mill, but. Nope. What that end up? I at? mean, the per theater take, honestly, is is. Yeah, people came out to the Mario. theater. People came out to the theater to see it. That's for sure. Um, Four hundred seventy-five. Couldn't million understand why. There, there must be diehard Marvel fans still. <laughs> they exist in the wild, in co- in coexistence with the real movie reviewers. Yeah. The ecosystem is diverse, mm-hmm. and it's beautiful for it. Speak. Well, we're still on the topic of movies. This isn't uh, trailers, but I did just see that the uh, sequel to the platform, uh, one of like a very famous Spanish movie that was released on Netflix uh, that yes, came out, I, I think, a couple years ago or something like that. Like uh, yeah, yeah. So they just announced that it's getting a sequel, which the, I, the platform. I See, they got to keep going with the series, and inst- as they instead of getting to platform ten, they have to pause, and they'll do they'll do part of a movie, right? And it'll be platform nine and three quarters. Yeah, I was wondering yeah. how you were going to swing this back around to the Harry Potter reference, and I won't say that you stuck the landing, but no, you got it there. <laughs> it happened. We we're, we're all worse off for it. We can move on with our lives. Yeah, they're keeping the same director, so. Whatever and, that means. And move on we will as we shift our focus to gaming news. Um, and, Correct. And we discuss gaming news. I have a review this week, so I'll, I'll hold that and go. Lovely. Towards the um, end. 
not 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 gaming news technically, but it's in Ko- it's in Kotaku. I went to Kotaku, um, <laughs> yeah. and I know, but you know, we you want when you find want to find the real rancid sort of gamer gamer takes. You know, that's where you want to go. <laughs> so, side note, um, Batman and there's a the Batman and the Justice League are doing a like cameo tie-in collaboration with Ruby. Ruibi. Ruby, Interesting. Ruby, 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 Ruby. And, oh yeah. And Batman is he he has bat wings now in this. Hmm. Okay. And so he's he's a bat man. Yep. Um that's that's all. It's Ruby. I not <laughs> not my thing. Um but, you know, yeah. just jail. You know, DC will just you know Kurt and I were talking about this on the way home from Guardians of the Galaxy. You <laughs> You literally cannot predict what the hell DC is going to come out with next, I, especially with James Gunn at the helm now. Yeah, they are they are like a fucking coked up, <laughs> greasy man. And, and much like the best coked up uh, business boys of the eighties, you know, they give us beautiful things with the with the with the Ninja Turtles like that. You know, they made the Batman uh, meets the Ninja Turtles crossover uh, animated film, pretty yeah, nifty, which uh, was um, based off. The comic run, yeah. We have a couple. Uh, well, my prior. actual gaming news is the the review or the comparison out here for the Asus uh, Rog Ally R- Rogally. Oh yes, the ROG Rogally. Ally. Yeah. Um, so they, I'm gonna skip the actual review because it's it feels like it's gonna be just sponsored content. Yeah. So um, I have heard a little bit about the general reception to it. Like it is the first, I would say legitimate competition to the steam deck. Cause while yeah, it is more expensive, it, it yeah, is and, Go ahead, Sorry. Yeah. I'm just, I'm going to give it the rundown uh, of all the specs it has here. And it kind of compares them directly to the steam deck. So if you want to ask, I can, I can put one up against the other. So uh, AMD Ryzen Z1 extreme Zen four. Um, RDNA three for the graphics, um, seven inch nine nineteen twenty by ten eighty so resolution 1080 instead of seven twenty. Yep, uh, one hundred twenty hertz, five hundred nits. Oh, that's pretty cool. That's one hundred twenty hertz. Um, five hundred twelve gigs of storage with a micro SD. Um, sixteen gigs RAM, LPDDR five. Mm-hmm. Uh, Xbox style control, so uh, but uh, a button, a D pad, and two uh, asymmetrical thumbsticks. Interesting. Um, programmability: two two back paddles, thumbstick dead zone, plus sensitivity, sensitivity and trigger sensitivity. Um, audio: dual front facing speakers, five one two surround sound, Dolby Atmos, uh, six six hundred and eight grams. Um, haptic feedback, armory crate launcher, which maybe that's their launcher. Um, fingerprint, fingerprint unlock, which is funny because this has what's notable is, is by its absence, uh, what this doesn't have is a touch screen. Oh, uh, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, it does not have a touch sensitive screen. So that's actually going to be a real problem for it. Yeah. Um, because it runs windows like generic windows and the the atlas launcher might be like a uh a controller friendly interface for windows but it's maybe i had that sorry maybe i had that wrong reading it again it doesn't have the touch pads ah okay but still that will make navigating uh in like PC mode more difficult. And the thing that I've heard most about the, uh, so first off, let's talk pricing. So the 512 gigabyte model comes in at $649, which is about, I think that's price parity with the 512 steam deck. Um, this has a much newer SOC in it, uh, that will be a lot more powerful. However, I wonder if so I wonder if it's it's got too much 
hardware in it. Because uh, one of the nice things about the Steam Deck is that they made really smart compromises uh, to deliver a experience that works very well in that form factor. And we've seen these really powerful handheld PCs from companies like Ioneo in the past, and they all have one thing in common, and that is that they chew through battery. And you have a higher resolution screen here. It's refreshing twice as much. Yeah, the the refresh rate, the 120 hertz. I, I notice on my phone I have that option to do go between 120 hertz and 60 hertz. And I I normally keep it on battery saver, which is 60 hertz. But when I have it on 120 hertz, it eats through my battery. I mean, it's an older phone, but that's We're what talking. I was just looking for. And it, they claim performance mode when it's on battery two hours of gaming yeah. Um, so yeah. you could almost say it's got two gears low gear and game gear <laughs> um the, there's Same also joke for all you boomers out there that's pretty good there's also a one terabyte model which um comes in at 899 uh the ssd is user replaceable so i I would hope that there's a accompanying there's some sort of spec increase um, yeah. to the one terabyte model to justify that much additional cost. Um, but again, I've I've heard I've heard some through the grapevine. Now I don't know if it's is it to market today or is it is it just um, like they've revealed I do not price. Know. So I don't I don't know if re, like reviews from real people I don't believe have come out yet. I don't believe the review embargo has lifted, but I have heard through what I consider to be reliable industry sources that the the performance is great, but the user interface needs a lot of work. Um Linus mm-hmm. of Linus Tech Tips on his 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 weekly podcast the Wan Show described it as the Steam Deck is like a console. It's got a a verified library of games that work well on it, and it's wrapped up in a very user-friendly experience um, that's very easy to interface with, and it just works. Whereas the ROG Ally is a lot more like having a computer with a controller attached to it. Um, and it's it's just not as pleasant to use. But um, I am very interested to see how well this does. Um, the Steam Deck feels like a winning team product where there's going to be a lot more... Com- it's going to have a larger install base. It's going to have... It's kind of like the iPod versus Zune, right? Zune had much better specs than competing iPods at a better price, too. But the iPod was the winning team product. It had the larger install base. It had the better support. It was, uh, you know, uh, dressed you, you, up like a yeah. premium thing. It had it had the uh, the killer apps. Yeah, and um, in the case so, of the Steam Deck, it still has the silver bullet, which is the base model Steam Deck, and it's very very attractive three ninety nine price tag. Yeah. Um, for reference, I did find uh, it. It will launch June thirteenth. Okay. Yeah, for again for seven hundred dollars. They almost had it for Juneteenth. Damn. So <laughs> close. Asus is reportedly. Wait, why would Asus? Is our no? Yeah, Asus ROG. Yeah, Asus. Asus. Yeah. Okay. I, I don't know why I thought MSI did ROG for a second there. Um. <laughs> Asus OS is is under development apparently, and uh, it will be able to link Steam, Epic, Origin, and Xbox Game Pass to the OS. So what that says to me is they're gonna run like a a different GUI over Windows, but it's gonna be Windows under the hood. Uh, mm. They're probably working on like what they have to do to make that legal. Um, but it does have some interesting features like. Uh, eGPU support, which the Steam Deck does not have. Um, at least not natively. There are hacky ways to get it to work. 
Um, But yeah, it'll be interesting to see how it does. I feel though, like it's going to go the way of the Zune where some people will buy it and they'll be really happy or like the way of Game Gear versus Game Boy. People are going to get it. There are going to be people that really like it and will swear up and down till they're blue in the face that it's a better product than the Steam Deck. But Steam Deck's probably going to do a lot better in the long run. And then when yeah, they come out with the Steam Deck 2, no one's going to talk about the Ally. Yeah. And and everyone knows, like you say to, to a game, you're like, oh, it's the, it's the Steam game console. And they go, oh, I get it. And you then you go and you say it's the Asus ROG Ally. They go, I, okay. Sure, kids. I'll put that right next to my Wonder Swan. <laughs> yeah. My what is it? The fucking what? The Nokia Z, the Zoo or the Zio or some shit. Um, they're yeah. they're infinite. They're infinity failed handheld consoles. Yeah. The N gauge. That's what I was thinking of. The N gauge. Yeah. I, I don't know that Nokia ah. did that. Yeah. Um nah, son. A lot of a lot of crazy shit. All right, Jake, what you got? Um, so the Legend of Zelda uh Tears of the Kingdom game is a a new game that just I think came out something some kind of video logical yeah, gaming. some weird RPG. There's been a million Zeldas out, and uh, for the life of me, I still don't know which one is Zelda. I think there is um some sort of like link cable you could trade Pokemon with. I think to this game, it, it's weird. <laughs> Anyways, it's wild that they're still using link cables. But um, Tears of the Kingdom just released. Um, reviews are in, flying in. Pickle Jeff tweets out reviews for Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom are flying in. IGN 3 out of 10. Destructoid 2 out of 10. GameSpot 2.5 out of 10. So not doing so great. Um, Huh. Funny joke. It is uh, 10 out of 10 across the board. um, Pretty much. Well, The random 9 out of 10, 9.75 out of 10 here and there. There are very few people brave enough to... uh give anything less than 10 to the latest Zelda game, lest they be attacked mercilessly by Accosted. the Zelda fanboys. Yeah. yeah, but from initial reviews, um, people playing it, they are loving it. They are saying it seems like the Breath of the Wild was a trial run for this. Um, I am interested to see what it'll be like. Uh, could be cool. The I mean, It's easy to to rag on it you know it's doesn't look any different from mm-hmm. breath of the wild waited a while for this to come out um also it's playing on the switch which arguably we should dig a hole and bury the switch 10 feet under yeah, and yeah. hope that no more games come out for it because at this point it's just like not there not up to par with where games should be performance wise um if it's optimized for great because i well, remember even breath, Re- breath of the wild, of the wild issues... ran i mean it ran pretty well on the switch for the, yeah. the scope of the game i'm thinking hey you know it's been like six years or whatever they probably optimized it because the game is the same essentially i think it's the same map um they use the same bones for this and just like added um a second story to it well i think of, like, i think the they kind of had to because I, I feel like Breath of the Wild was kind of... I mean, I guess it came out on the Wii U, so it it's not that demanding. But I feel like they couldn't push the Switch much further than they did with Breath of the Wild, lest they end up with like a Legends Arceus or a Scarlet and Violet type uh, yeah. run performance. A lot of discretion. My my biggest issue with Tears of the Kingdom is that this is a Switch game that is retailing for $70 when all previous first-party Nintendo games on the Switch retailed for $60. Now, I know Sony and Microsoft are charging $70 for next-gen games, but they actually have next-gen hardware, Nintendo. You are charging me $10 more for a game on a device that is seven fucking years old, running a chip that's a year older than that even, so the hardware in it is eight fucking years old. 
you know, there I think there used to be a time where uh Nintendo games were even uh cheaper by quite a bit. Than I think in the GameCube what, era they often like, were ten dollars yeah, cheaper. GameCube, Game Boy, DS games, a lot of those, like even you know, those are handheld, but still they were cheaper than what you were getting your Xbox games for, and they were, you know, as fun or, or you know, they, they itched that scratch that couldn't be itched by Xbox. And that was a nice feature is that they were cheaper. You didn't have to spend $60 on a handheld game. And the other kind of point to that, and this kind of encompasses all games that are now up to about $70, even if you account for inflation, you know, oh, you know, inflation's gotten it up to $70 by now. It's like, it, it makes sense to be paying that. Back in the day, we were also paying for manufacturing of discs and, cases and distribution and now it's a digital download i think to ask for 70 dollars for an unfinished game on a digital download okay. definitely is still unfinished is is true i yeah. you see that's it's an argument i kind of see both sides on right because um xbox 360 debuted in 2005 and brought with it the 60 dollar standard pricing on games it was fifty dollars the previous generation costs went up as game development costs rose game development costs have continued to rise but the price stayed pretty much the same so i understand like where there is justification to raise the price because it has not really kept pace with inflation if we kept pace with inflation you know a 60 dollar game in 2005 probably cost close to 80 something dollars and even back in the day, you know, like nineteen eighties games to, to game. yeah. were like could be like an NES game could go for sixty bucks on its own. And in nineteen eighty dollars, that's closer to like a hundred dollars today. So And that was I mean, that was kind of infamously or, or colloquially, vernacularly, uh, the reason for Nintendo hard difficulty. Yeah. Was trying to maximize the value for your very expensive game that ran on a 16-bit system um hmm. so does the about but at the same that time value now as a consumer i see that games now are not being sold i'm not buying a complete game for what i'm buying because you know there's going to be a wave or two of dlc so they're going to want the season pass out of me and there's going to be other microtransaction opportunities so to get everything that would have shipped on the disc in ye, ye olden days, I'm probably looking at poning up like 120 to $150, which is mm-hmm. a lot of money, even relative to uh, yeah. you know the past days. So I see both sides of the argument. Um, I mean, I don't want to pay more money for games. So obviously I'm kind of on the side of like, why would you fucking raise the price? <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I didn't. I didn't realize they raised the price. I haven't checked out like to buy it at all, so I didn't realize they yeah. did up it's, it to seven dollars. Which is, I mean, I guess for me, the more egregious thing is that Nintendo doesn't believe in sales. Yes, um, and they don't believe in like B properties because um, the kind of sticking one for me is the uh, Advance Wars Reboot Camp One and Two, which is a graphical update port of Advance Wars One and Two. Um, which were Game Boy for Advance all intents games, and purposes, right? they, huh? They were Game Boy Advance games, right? Yeah, they put it's kind of like Link's Awakening, um, where they put the fresh coat of paint on it and gave a little voice acting to it. Um, and Link's Awakening, I feel, could at least pretend to justify its its full price tag because it's a Zelda property, so Zelda has to go for it. But um, no such franchise love <laughs> exists for Advance Wars. I like Advance Wars, but there's not like Advance it has its Wars. fans, but it's not Zelda. Yeah. yeah. Uh, nonetheless, they charge a full sixty dollars for this port and graphics upgrade of two games. I mean, yeah, and like look what they did with uh, Mario 3D All Stars. It's <laughs> it was yeah. sixty dollar bundle of games that Nintendo themselves had recently sold at prices that if you just paid them would have been like forty five dollars. And they fucking made it a limited time release. <laughs> Nintendo's exactly. been very scummy over this the Switch years. Yeah. Um 
So they're not a fun company to to like rally behind because they, on one hand, they feed you; on the other hand, they, they are reaching you. into your reaching into your back pocket and just swiping everything you got. One hand in your mouth, another hand in your ass. I'm not saying and, I wouldn't shake hands with Nintendo. I'm just saying I'd count my fingers afterwards. You know what I you mean? You know, and and that's not even that's not even to mention all the stuff they do behind the scenes with like um, IP restrictions yeah, and the way they treat games. their fan base. How they they you know DMCA mm-hmm. strike people, copyright strike that's, people who are just trying to like have fun with their game. And, and it's, it's almost quite, it's very clear what they're doing. There's almost no like um subtlety about it where you can tell that they're about to re-release a game when they start cracking down on any properties associated with it yeah Yeah, which is so strange another metroid 2 remake got shut down everyone's like yep okay they're finally remaking metroid 2 (laughs) because the reason i bring this up is because there literally was just a thing where somebody who's uh very prominent or very uh yeah i guess prominent in the breath of the wild community uh, got copyright strike multiple times for like an allowable. It was a, I guess it was a mod, or it was, I guess it was a mod, but it was a, technically allowable under their terms and conditions. And they were playing it for uh, on YouTube, and they mm-hmm. took down that. Took down. Didn't send the Pinkertons after him, did they? Several others. I think no, they but might they... now that they've seen Watson get away with that. They're gonna be like, "Wait, they you can do that?" Because they just, <laughs> can... they just, you know, ruined this guy's, you know, monetary. I mean, they, they might have they pulled him his, for like a they month. They pulled but... his plug out of the matrix. <laughs> yeah, they, they messed <laughs> him up. They took a bunch of took a bunch of videos that he's he edited on you know his own time and just threw that in the fucking garbage. And then on top of that. With with a lot of those copyright strikes, if you get too many of them, you do get your your channel yeah. deleted. You can, you can your channel can from... get suspended. It can get deleted. It's not it's not a good thing. And like the yeah. appeal system sucks. Yeah, they don't have yeah, to give any knows, evidence yeah. whatsoever to like say no. Our we're in the right, and they can just say no, no, no. We reject it. And, and what are you gonna do? Sue Nintendo? The chances no. of an actual person at YouTube? I couldn't put my dad out of business like that. <laughs> fearing your case is is very small, yeah. and at any point they could just be like, oh, "We're gonna side with Nintendo." Sorry, kid. So what yeah. we're trying to say is Nintendo. Nintendo got that Nintendo dog in them, and it's not a good one. It's a bully. <laughs> bad dog. It's a bully breed. Yeah. Um, all right, so I guess I'll I'll go now with uh, my review of Hi-Fi Rush. Um, Hi-Fi Rush is a game that kind of came out of nowhere, I think, for a lot of people. It wasn't a release that was on uh, my radar, certainly. Um, but I saw it pop up on Game Pass, and it was getting a lot of positive buzz, and I... I started to play it, and then I had an issue where uh, Game Pass wouldn't fucking run at all on my computer, and uh, I recently re- reinstalled Windows, and that fixed that issue, so I got to finish it up, and um, you know, almost by virtue of it being like the one game that released in a finished state in 2023, it's an early mm-hmm. front runner for Game of the Year, but um, it it definitely is in contention for that on its own merits. Um, It is a super charming, kind of like anime cyberpunk-ish art style. Um, All the characters are are a lot of fun. Um, I can see, you know, every person who plays the game kind of having their own favorite character based on their own personality traits. Um, It's... It's got a great gameplay loop to it. Um, it is a rhythm game <laughs> masquerading as an action game, but is actually also really an action game. Uh, the combat has a lot of depth to it. It has the same mm-hmm. sort of uh, controls you'd come to expect in a action game these days with uh, light and heavy attacks, uh, You know, a dodge button, the ability to parry, um, it actually has a very similar control scheme to Sifu to the point where I would accidentally hit the wrong button when I was trying to parry things. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the key to doing well is to stay on rhythm to the music. Your attacks always hit on beat, 
So if you don't have great rhythm, you can just watch your attacks land and press the button as they land, kind of like a uh, critical strike in an Arkham game or in uh, uh, Shadow of Mortar slash Shadow of War game, because that gotcha. ripped the combat right from the Arkham games. Um, and there's different enemies with different attack patterns and there are, you know, different strengths of enemies. And they do a great job of taking that basic concept of like, you know, rhythm based timing and varying the mechanics enough to keep the, the levels interesting. It's not a super long game. It took me about 10 hours of gameplay to get through, but every level had a lot of, it was very unique in setting. Um, a lot of there are a lot of enemies that are reused, but they introduce unique enemies. Uh, you have partner characters you basically can call in an assist from, uh, which mm-hmm. much like Marvel can lead to some crazy combo potential once you uh, invest in the right uh, traits. And by the end of my my time with the game, I was pulling off uh, like pretty much whole combat combos of mm-hmm. like four hundred hits plus. You were taking them for a ride. Yes, and it was it was a lot of fun. It's it's very visually appealing when you uh like there are certain combo enders where you can call in an assist partner and it'll like launch them and hang them up in the air and then you can go and do an air combo and there are also air combo versions of all the assists. So then you can cycle through it, you end up with three. But and different enemies require different assists to be called to to make them vulnerable to damage. So you have to plan mm-hmm. around well, you know, you have to kind of dance around waiting for your cis character, the appropriate assist character to recharge while, you know, you're still doing damage and attacking on rhythm, keeping your combo up. So the combat is very engaging um, and very deep, and I feel like if you play it on hard, I play through on normal, it would be a very fun challenge, fun but fair challenge. And that's how I describe this game. Uh, there were definitely moments that were challenging, and I think there are some, there are some times where, uh, like, little actuation mini games went on a little too long. I'm like, okay, there's too much stuff. It's hard to keep it all straight. Mm -hmm. Um, But they were few and far between. Uh, Like I said, every level was very unique um, and introduced new enemy types that you had to, to deal with. Um, The story is kind of basic. Uh, You, uh, the main character, Chai signs up for the Armstrong project from uh, Vandalay Technologies, which I kept thinking of Vandalay Industries from Seinfeld. Right, I'm sure, um, on purpose. And I, I, made, I made many so-you-want-to-be-my-latex salesman jokes uh, during the my first few hours with the game. Mm-hmm. Um, but the Armstrong project uh, gives uh, cybernetic limb augmentations to people, uh, not necessarily because they're disabled or whatever, but Chai gets gets cold feet i think or or realizes that not everything might be above board and he kind of has an accident where his music player is infused to his chest and that deals with his power and he sees the world in song now so like everything in the world around you like pulses to the beat of the music in the soundtrack uh for a game like this to work the soundtrack would have to be good and i am happy to say that it is an excellent soundtrack um, it's got a lot of great original tracks in it. It's got a lot of great um, licensed tracks in it, and everything blends in, and it fits the all the songs fit the mood of the levels, and some of them are kind of earwormy. And the sound effects that they add in for like when you're doing a combo, uh, you really kind of get to, especially with the original songs, kind of influence the tone and timbre of the music as you play the game, and it it feels really cool to both be pulling off these awesome combos and having the music accompany your actions because we as as we all know from uh you know the uh Cronado trilogy <laughs> timing your your action beats to your music beats is very effective yes um and i i feel like this is a game that uh peter would definitely very much enjoy um and anyone who's a fan of Rhythm games and uh, likes, you know, cell shaded graphics type stuff. I think you'll enjoy this. I think there's characters that uh, work for everyone. Uh, the story, like I said, is pretty good. Uh, the Armstrong Project turns out to be um, pretty nefarious in nature. So Chai teams up with 
Peppermint, who has an axe to grind with Vandalay, and you have more people uh, coming to your crew as the story progresses. I won't, I won't Some spoil Some quirky too much. characters. Yeah, everyone has, has a unique personality, and they're pretty all developed characters. They're not like one note. Um, and, you know, you can see the the characters grow closer together as the story progresses and it all pays off in a very satisfying way. And, uh, it's, it's a really fun game to play. And I think it's a mm-hmm. game that people are going to play through, uh, more than once because it's, it's that fun an experience. And even though the campaign's a little short at 12 hours, there's a lot of bonus content to go back and unlock. I haven't even come close to unlocking everything. Uh, there's different challenges and achievements you can do. Um, so you'll definitely get your money's worth. And the game's only $30, um, mm-hmm. which isn't that expensive. That's <laughs> Hey, they took their short game and they made it less money? Yeah, imagine that, right? Wow. Um, all right. I have the softest softball question for you here. Shoot. Um, would you, Kirk, would you say that this is what a next-gen... Uh, rhythm action game or you know rhythm yeah rhythm game should look like um yeah i would i would say so i think this is, is this a very what, what you is this the bar now for what what these kind of games should do um i i think i think it's kind of a tough tough to say that in such a broad strokes kind of way cuz um as like just a straight rhythm game um, it kind of doesn't conform to that because, like, you can have terrible rhythm and still make it through the game okay. Um, yeah. So it is at its core an action game, but I do I do like the the marrying of the two genres this closely. So, like, if they were gonna do something like an elite beat agents for the next generation, I think templating it after Hi Fi Rush in certain ways will work, but not every rhythm game can be you know like an action adventure game also so i i say that this this is definitely my new like if you ask me what my favorite rhythm game of all time is i'm going to tell you hi-fi rush because that counts and you have to deal with it (laughs) but i don't know that every uh every rhythm game could be this but if every rhythm game is to be this well made i think we're in good shape and uh like completely bug three ran great on my system not very hard to run very well optimized game on unreal engine 4 which has produced some pretty poorly optimized turds um in recent years um highly recommended i'd i'd give it i'd give it like an eight and a half out of ten well there you go there you have it um you you sold me on you actually sold me on tight controls well optimized runs well for you know and then also triple a yeah like it's it, it's amazing a bethesda published game coming out completely free <laughs> like they fucking red... sealed the doors put the anti-tod locks on and said we're just gonna make the game and it'll be done when it's done red right? Hall <laughs> and hi-fi rush are like the 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 ends of the scale <laughs> like <laughs> yeah they are diametric opposites in every conceivable way. Um, so yeah, oh, cool. I, I recommend anyone check it out. It is on Game Pass, and it will probably stay on Game Pass because Microsoft owns Bethesda. So you can you can play it for as little as a dollar if you finish it in your trial month. So gotcha, gotcha, dollar. Gotcha. Um, and now, drum roll, please. Uh, our our feature. <laughs> Right, right at the end here. Um, got a good. Got got, got three. <laughs> the last one, James Gunn's MCU send off. It was emotional. It was exciting. It was a movie full of guns and guns. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> if you couldn't gunny. hear the inflection in my voice right there, I included an N because he put, Sean he put his Gunn eyebrows in that it. one. Yeah. And they were also PPUs. Um, okay, it was. I thought. Let's get off first impression, spoiler free section. I thought this was um, a refreshing break from the multiversal um, kind of 
I don't know, headache? What'd you call it? <laughs> yeah, the morass. Fuck? The, uh, the assault of multiversal movies that have been coming after us um, ever since this, the, 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 seek, the adventure for another Infinity War saga. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, Guardians of the Galaxy has always been slightly the, uh, like departed from the rest of the uh, It really Avengers hasn't been James saga. Gunn's Guardians of the Galaxy series. Yeah. And more it's... than Marvel's. Uh, Disney presents Marvel presents Guardians of the Galaxy. Yeah, and there's definitely moments in here where you see you hear James Gunn's voice through the lens of Chris Pratt, uh, and and he is a little peeved with some decisions that were made, uh, which I don't know if that deters from the movie or detracts from it, or if it adds to a little bit of the background nuance that you know we can enjoy. Um, but I thought. It did what I think like Love and Thunder tried to do, and it just executed it better because I think Guardians of the Galaxy. Yeah, I would agree with that. Is is the the movie that kind of started it with uh with like the whole um, undercutting of uh, tense emotional moments with comedy and jokes and wit, mm-hmm. um, yeah. and knowing when to take it too far or where to take it to a certain level and where not to go too far you know sometimes they probably push it a couple places but not in the sense of like Taika Waititi's uh infamous I have cancer just kidding no I don't ha 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 cut away to Valkyrie and Korg talking about how fucking Korgs are gay yeah Uh, 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 it's like, <laughs> no, it's the comedy builds character. They lead to one thing or another. They're callbacks. It's quality comedy, not just like one-off uh, posh jokes here and there. Um, it, it it was quality writing. I thought it was written well. I thought the acting was su- the thing that surprised me the most. Chris Pratt kind of came into his own in a couple scenes and he's not a bad actor i don't know where this this reputation is coming from i'm not no i'm just it usually you don't see a whole lot of great like i i know you don't think that but like i have heard that i mean he wasn't the greatest in in jurassic world um i think he's always done pretty good at peter quill i think to be honest i think he's been good like he's cast he's often cast appropriately for his strengths Right, he's yeah. but he's his casualty is that the movies he's cast in are often very generic people pleaser movies that don't require a a strong performance or would not necessarily pull like a a you know award winning performance out of any yeah. of the actors. Yeah, um, I, I think we talked he's... about that during the Mario movie where he just sort of he does good because he sort of just disappears into uh, the role a yeah. regular know pretty generic main character sort of role for mario yeah like like his 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 portrayal of mario and maybe this is more the writing than anything to be honest maybe not necessarily a chris pratt fault but more just like a the mario didn't seem like a mario it seemed like chris pratt was talking as a mario would yeah i I feel that many of that movie's deficiencies lied with its script (laughs) like yeah so it's not like he was like you know acting as you know, becoming the Mario. It's yeah. whereas in in Peter Quill, when whenever he's acting as Peter Quill, it, you you sense a little bit more of a deeper connection to the character, uh, and it seems like they care. And Which, I, I think I think the one thing that we see with a lot of James Gunn properties is that he usually tends to work with a select group of people who are attached and motivated and um, encouraged to put their heart and soul into these things. Some may call it nepotism with his wife and and uh, brother to put it in there, but there's also a lot of people who he he brings in who knows are going to give a good performance. Right. Um, before before we get yeah. too far off Chris Pratt and the Mario movie, um, I should we'll throw this this tidbit in here. Um, this is the other movie released in May 2023 <laughs> featuring Chris Pratt in a starring role and using No Sleep Till Brooklyn in a montage yes. scene. <laughs> yep. Yep. Which I like incredibly really pointed out. The same the month. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I saw that. That was that was pretty uh, pretty good. Well, I guess the Mario movie came out at the end of April, but still, like within within like three weeks. 
Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I don't have as positive a view of this movie. Like, it's not bad. I, I can't say that it's bad. And there are, there are things about it that are strong. It, it had moments of time where it kind of hit that Guardian's groove that, uh, drew me into the first movie. Um, but there were times where it it did some other things that I wasn't so into. And um, I don't think it particularly budgeted its, its time very well. It opened a lot of plot threads that it didn't do a super great job of closing. Or, like, I would say it... It started some story arcs that it didn't really commit to, commit a lot of screen time to, and kind of either pushed aside or uh, rushed to resolution. Um, and there is there is some content in it that is going to be disturbing for a lot of people. Uh, yeah, if you if you are squeamish about animal abuse, for sure. Yeah. There are... uh, steer clear of this one. That's not even a spoiler. That's just kind of the plot of it is the villain and the backstory is all about Rocket Raccoon's abuse at the hands of uh, cruel animal testers. Mm-hmm. Um, and James Gunn, he really just opens up, he, he, he slices open the cranium, sticks his little fingies into your emotional cortex and says, I am assuming direct control now. Yeah. I mean, you can, you can, uh, it, it might be seen as like a cheap way to get like an emotional connection out of a movie. Um, it worked, whether or not uh, so, you know, people are going to like it or not. It worked uh, in so far as I definitely, uh, despite the main villain kind of being uh, very forgettable, even amongst a large pantheon of wait, forgettable. Really? Vill- yeah, I thought so. Oh, I. I thought he was really good. And, I mean, the yeah. actor was good, but the character is fairly inconsequential. Um, and didn't really pose an existential threat to the universe or the galaxy. Well, I think a lot of people he... would also, although I will say, I think a lot of people enjoy it for particularly that reason, that um, having to save the world all the time um, was, was maybe getting a little stale. Yeah, so having, I, you, having a smaller story was a, was a positive point for some. You know, and, and they joke about I, it in the way. they joke about it in the second one um, where they're like, "Oh, here we go, saving the universe again," um, and you know, kind of getting away from that is 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 nice every now and then. You know, you could you could argue that the high evolutionary's end goal maybe was to conquer the universe. Uh, whether or not he would have been successful because he was a flawed villain in that. Like he, like his, his grand designs weren't perfect, uh, you know, with his Mm -hmm. earth to that. And when we've seen this in the trailer um, where that, that's not his end goal. That wasn't, if that was his, his like crowning achievement, it kind of sucked. So um, he's definitely long ways away from achieving those goals. Um, but I thought he was uh, uh, pretty good. I mean, I liked his design. Um, I guess his his abilities were kind of like shoehorned in there. Random gravity powers. Not sure if that's canon to the comics Maybe. or not. But yeah, I I just his, felt his like depi- he was I... a very just like like he's a meanie. Like that's his defining <laughs> character trait. I I saw him as somebody who maybe in the beginning definitely was um you know had a more complex character uh like uh anatomy but after the accident which you know he has a different face uh he is definitely corrupted to a point where he's got like a one track mind and kind of like psychotic um, so I, I saw that as like they're two different characters. He definitely went through like a really crazy character. Uh, like he, he fell off the edge essentially towards the end of the movie. And mm-hmm. whereas if you compare him to where he was in the beginning, he definitely had a clearer goal and was much more, um, I mean, heartless. I mean, it was mm-hmm. similar to how like Thanos was with with how just you know for the know, betterment right? of society. 
he was I think pretty heartless thing. in the beginning, from my perspective, yeah. at least. Um, and I guess I would say they've done this in the first couple, so maybe he didn't want to do it here. But I do, I do enjoy myself a campy, a campy megalomaniacal villain who is just going to to ham it up. And I will say, um, who who's our boy? Who's our actor? Uh, for the high evolutionary. Oh. Oh, uh, Ejiwai or something. Uh, he's got a he's got a hard name. It's yeah, it's very African. Okay, but um, Barak, he did. I I enjoyed like I do it's sticking out in my mind those kind of eruptions of anger, right? Well, he'll just like explode. He explodes into fury at, uh, at yeah, the failures. Like, or I at, I at the, not... you know, I like that. Um, his character design. I feel like they just said. James Gunn said, "No, I'm not going to do your multiverse stuff." Yeah, Chick- like, Rudy. but what if you, what if you made him like, you know, just like Kang, but like, you know, don't make it too obvious that, <laughs> that we so, made you copy off our homework. I, we'll I was going to bring it up. Yeah, I was going to bring it up later, and I don't know if it was intentional or what. There's no way they could have had this foresight, but it is, um coincidental that we have a purple black villain um, who could be used as a uh, variant of Kang if there ever needed to be a recasting of Kang in the future. If, if maybe... yeah, I heard people like pondering about like, oh, how are you going to recast once because of Jonathan Majors? And it's like, this one is going to be the easiest. Yeah. All yeah. you have to do is say, oh, it's a different multiverse. And you don't even okay. have to like... Let's not forget that Marvel recasted Rhodey with no explanation. Yeah, I I almost would be they recasted um, the Hulk with no explanation. I, yeah. yeah, you could you could put him in that role. I I mean I would almost just like if you do have to recast Jonathan Majors, I would just go back to the drawing board. You can you can have him try out and see see if it'd be a good fit. Um, but you know, look around and I would argue just say give no explanation like mm-hmm. fuck it who cares and yeah and i wouldn't i definitely wouldn't say have him have um chukwudi uh, chukwudi wuji um role for this because one thing that marvel has been really good about is not uh being sp- at least very sparing of reusing actors yeah in different roles i don't i don't actually i don't think they've had any repeats i don't believe you can, so. you're free to disprove me on that that is off the top of my dome so well well, they um, could just they could just play it off as the high evolutionary was another um, a Kang variant because they don't have to be named Kang, they don't have to be named. Well, Andy it's not Richards. like he has. Uh, I don't think we ever heard him referred to as anything other than the high evolutionary. So yes, he might even so, be named Kang. Who knows? Oh yeah, true. That's that's very true. I I for, totally forgot about that. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, he's, yeah, he's just listed as the high evolutionary in IMDb, and that's what it's always referred to. Um, but you know, that was I, the original um, you know reason to bring up like multiversal kings in the comics was they had all these bad guys that they retconned into all being variants of Kang from different multiverses that they just said, oh yeah. All these big bad guys were just the same guy, uh, and this is where we have the Council of Kings, and that was a big reveal in the comics. Right, and we, um, I think we talked about that in Quantumania, how they just did yeah. that backwards. Yeah, they did yeah. it backwards. So, um, like I said, Chuck Booty Awaji, he he sunk his teeth into the role. Like he, I'm not criticizing his performance. I just think the character of the High Evolutionary was a little lacking for me. Um, they they kind of bastardized Adam Warlock, which I didn't yeah, care really for. Did. Yeah, I the uh, Adam Warlock, I like I, I'm remembering vaguely from like the comics, but that was um they they retconned a lot of stuff with the sovereign and those people being like experiments of well, I guess this is kind of going to spoiler territory, but um mm-hmm. uh you know, we were all postulating that Adam Warlock was going to come in around Infinity War because he was like the tool that, was... that used the Mind Stone to kill Thanos, and we're like waiting for it because they set it up and just never. I mean, never took literally off. the first thing when when he's flying across the screen in his first scene, I said, "Well, four mi- movies too late, buddy." <laughs> yeah. Um. 
yeah, they, they really did him dirty. And um, yeah, I just whatever. I mean, we're, we were all joking. Like they got the actor from We're the Millers. Yeah. To do him. And <laughs> we said, you know, there's a, there a line in the movie where he's like, it's, it, you know, he goes through a thing late in the movie. He's like, ah, I'm here for my redemption. I'm like, yeah, you, be- you better get a redemption. Um, which by the end of the movie, no spoilers, but um, but he ends up um, he he's he sticks around, and I guess he get he gets his redemption. You may see more of that character. Um, more more to my peeving point was like we are we are deep in the Marvel uh, asterisk zone, I'll call it, where um, in any given scene, like you'll see stuff, and there'll be an asterisk of see also this. Now this is not we've been in here for a while. But I think I'm finally at the point where I'm not keeping up with all of this, and it's taken me by surprise. Um, like I had to explain to Kurt that all, some of these characters showed up from the the Guardians of the Galaxy holiday special, like Cosmo, yeah. the the Wonder Dog, um, and we didn't even know about one. There was there was one Ravager who had a sling ring. Yeah, just comes out of a Doctor Strange sling oh, ring portal, and yeah. we're like, did one of them know magic? What, what, um, where did you come from, buddy? I think- I think that's like a reveal on this. That's I don't think that's even and they, set yeah up they never anything. they never like paid any lip service. No, none of the guardians were like, "Hey, where did you learn that trick? I've seen that one before." I mean, I I just think it's neat world building to kind of I'm not, show I'm and not, not necessarily... like explain. Well, I think it's I think it's neat storytelling because they're not like explaining out this random dude's background they just show you the slip ring mm-hmm. and you know dr mm-hmm. strange magic from anywhere you're like oh okay so maybe this sort of magic exists on other planets in in the universe that's interesting i'm not I saying mean, it's in a sense consequential why, probably not right but in a sense this is what we've been training for and kind of what we what we i guess what the uh, hope was right at the beginning was that you'd have these kind of movies where just shit happens in them. And if you've, if you've seen the stuff leading up to it, you have at least the, the idea or the context um, to kind of just say, okay, I, I kind of at least get it on a surface level. I feel like um, yeah. this is the sort of thing, well, not so much the, the sling ring, but the, the like, uh, you know, me having seen all the guardians movies, but not the holiday special and, and needing to be introduced to new characters as you do more and more of that. Uh, and we're coming up. The next Marvel movie is going to be with two characters that got established in TV shows. It, it really makes it a tough ask for the casual audience to really get invested in it. Um, and that's where, where a lot of your money is going to come from. I, yeah, I guess, but like, I, I'm trying to view it from the perspective of like the MCU and Disney, where they say if you're really committed to this or if you do like this, you can go in and look more and and, and delve deeper into more content if you want. I mean, that's ultimately what they're trying to produce. People want content; they want to consume content, and they're providing it as an optional form now. Whether or not I that's that's the major thing is whether or not this stuff that they're producing on the side is optional or not. Yeah, I don't. That's going to be the biggest tell I think during the Marvels to see how much they're bringing from the shows that needs to be like an explainer, or if they're just going to give a blurb about them getting their powers. They could just explain it all away in the in the movie, which done tactfully, I think can work. But mm-hmm. I don't think they're going to execute it very well. I think it's going to be a little bit of an exposition. Dump. I think it's kind of hard yeah. to do that for a principal character. Like, yeah, I mean, you need like a whole explainer of how Maria Rambeau got her powers during WandaVision, and or same with who Kamala the fuck Khan. Kamala Khan even is. Well, yeah, just this <laughs> random girl. Is she like just... a genie or something? Um, no, no. Is this one. She's a, she's a bit harder because her backstory is like a it's little not the wackier. comics one. Yeah. No, she I guess she is like a race of another interdimensional like <laughs> her grandma was an alien I think like and it has some being. 
but it has some connection to like the Kree as well. And basically her bloodline is the only one that can utilize the bracelets. Her she has a she has a bracelet, so it's a MacGuffin, but only her bloodline can utilize the powers of it. This um, is like No Way Home levels of Ned just slipping in. And sometimes my gr- I got the tinglys in my fingers, and then he does the magic by the end of the movie. <laughs> it's it's very convenient. It's it's because I think oh they also kind of set her up as like a mutant as well. Like like her yeah. her her blood has like a a mutagenic like thing, or her, her DNA is mutagenic. In the comics, wasn't she one of the immortals? I don't um, not the immortals, but um the Inhumans. Inhumans, uh, yes. yes. Well, she was an inhuman. So in this version, she's more a mutant based on her bloodline that may or may not be interdimensional. They kind of touched upon it. Um, but basically only her family can activate this bracelet thing that gives her the powers of like light. She can make hard light, basically. Um, oh, like like it, yeah. like uh, Maria Rambeau. Like or Monica Rambo. So Rambeau. Monica Rambo is like more photon energy. She like makes just blast. She's more similar to Captain Marvel, to be honest. I guess I understand why they decided to write the plot where it was was that these these characters have you know the the contrivances that they have similar enough powers that they they're just like the universe fucking does a floating point error switch <laughs> and just like oh shit I forgot which light based superhero is which yeah who they is all here, have who is there. They all have similar powers, but they're all from different sources, which I think is going to lose a little. Some people, it makes more sense if they're all from different, um, or all from the same power source or some of that. Because Captain Marvel got hers from uh, an Infinity Stone, and then uh, Wanda gave hers to uh, Maria or Monica Rambo. I forgot which one it is. And then mm-hmm. Kamala has it just based off being a mutant and having this MacGuffin. Uh, so how they're going to connect that with like changing places no fucking clue um but that's not this movie but that's uh, not yeah. the movie we're talking about uh, in, in terms of this movie i think it was a lot better done in terms of like needing side stuff like i guess the only thing and it's not even that consequential is learning that mantis is chris Pratt or uh peter quill's sister or stepsister i guess mm-hmm. a half sister rather which I out. I did not know that that was like literal. I thought that was like a a spiritual. We're, we're yeah, like sisters. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, and I thought he meant it, like a close friend. <laughs> but it doesn't really come up. Like they mention it literally twice, I think, and it never really has any consequence because I feel like they gave her a super power boost though, where she can just like mind control on touch. I didn't think her power was that potent. Um. In, well, in the previous movie we've never she's we've, got a i mean this is the most action she's been involved in outside of endgame so she had a little bit in uh the hollywood or the hollywood the, the christmas special the hollywood special <laughs> the hollywood special <laughs> that's where the, you blow uh, a dude on special. a casting couch <laughs> she she definitely did a couple more things that showed this off there so it wouldn't be a surprise if you saw that but you know you just kind of have to be like okay yeah she's fighting and training and learning to use her powers more in yeah. like a combat setting. I feel like the uh, one of my, I, I'd say that this is probably the best MCU movie I've seen in a while. I don't know yeah. exactly how far back I'll go, but I'm, that's kind of in my mind, damning it with faint praise. I mean, it, it's not bad. I, I, I kind of waffle back and forth on it. I don't think it's bad. I don't think it's one I'd see again. And I don't know that I would, call it a franchise saver um and i feel like part of the issue with this one is you know james gunn's going off to to run the competition essentially here and um i feel like his vision for this movie was curbed a bit by the studio because it feels like there are times in this movie where someone from the studio was in the edit and was like, mm, this is feeling a little too dark. Let's inject some jokes here. And a lot of the comedy didn't feel as like situationally appropriate as it was in the other two yeah. movies. Yeah, let's. I think this is a good enough time. I think we made our thoughts clear. This is where we can get into spoilers about the plot. Um, yeah, I, I kind of felt so. I was. It was a very, I guess, bold thing 
the way he went with this movie. Uh, this is Rocket Raccoon's uh, mm-hmm. special story, um, so it includes his backstory. And um, I don't disagree with them with him going for just going full send on um, you know really push playing the herd animal card just to like really get you in that zone. Um, I think for me personally, I think it took it a little too far and put me out of the movie. Um, partially because I didn't know about the whole, I didn't feel the, I didn't know the whole runtime. So when we got to the middle of the movie and he gets to the climax of Rocket's backstory and it's like super tragic. Um, I think I heard, I definitely heard some people crying in the theater, you know? Um, yeah. And I'm like, this is, I felt like, oh, this is like a little soon. I feel like this should be the, the uh, impetus for the lead up to the climax there. So maybe a scene or two early, a little strange on that. And then I realized as the movie keeps going that it, that was like the halfway point of the movie. Um, if, if I had known that starting, I might have, I might have felt a little bit differently about that. Um, but it felt like they were trying to me to swing away from that and not, yeah. I, I wanted them to give it a little more impact or at least you know, kind of carry over in the tone from that, from that climactic flashback through um, when it felt to me like they just, they're trying to steer out of it so that no one, you know, it didn't become a downer, but like, oh, you know what? I, I would be okay with the downer. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh God, I lost my train of thought as soon as my mouth opened. Um, Jesus. So like I guess just I I um the animal stuff really bugged me personally. Um I don't like seeing animals mistreated. Um and even though they don't really show you anything direct, the implications are strong enough. And there's literally a scene where um fucking the high evolutionary shoots uh three Little adorable bunny. animals. Yeah, uh, one of yeah. which is a bunny. Um, and like, I, you can have, I'm not saying it's wrong to have upsetting stuff in your movie. You can do that. It's fine. I personally, um, it it put me off the movie quite a bit. See, but I don't think that's a reason to like say it's not. I just said that I'm not saying you can't have it and it put me off. Well, you're, you're saying it put you off the movie and I think that's It put me personally off the movie. I think that's I reject your You opinion. have had just, <laughs> just equally as silly takes I, on Marvel movies I, before. I, I don't know. It it's it is it it's uh so I, I watched the uh the red letter media a uh, review of this and it, it is so funny they made a a poignant statement where uh and one of them had a similar approach where they they the, you know the animal abuse was really shocking and and took me uh by surprise and and kind of made me feel a certain way. But I can I can sit there, you know, cringe at that, but also watch like twenty people just get vaporized and not feel a single thing for that. And it's like, yeah, I I do. We we do. We watch war movies. We we go and we praise war movies like nineteen forty two that are they're based on like real events. These things actually what nineteen twelve, sorry, I don't know what it was. Seventeen. Nineteen seventy. <laughs> a date. A date. Uh, you know, real events that happened on planet Earth and depicting in very gruesome scenes these things that happen, and we praise it for, well, you know, being so emotionally you visceral. You and I might praise it, but there are for, for some people, that's enough to turn them off the movie. And it, it, it's very valid if they feel like that imagery is upsetting. I think it's... I'm not it's, saying that that's why this movie I'm, is bad. Or I'm not saying that's not upsetting, but I'm saying the purpose of that adds to the complexity of the movie, which which is shocking because we don't really have complex Marvel movies, really. They're usually right. one note kind of like Love and Thunder failed at trying to put cancer, a very <laughs> like depressing, visceral message into a movie and they fucking played it off as a joke 
while this movie yeah. takes that and it understands how serious it is, and you had two sides learning about this essentially animal cruelty, not you know split mm. hairs and say oh high evolutionary did experience you know essentially two um, sides rocket seeing it from his perspective in the flashbacks and us as an audience seeing it from that perspective as well and also seeing the rest of the team view it learning about rocket when they're trying to save him you you kind of get that both at the same time they're learning about this this awful torture that happened and that props up the high evolutionary as this just evil person that needs to be stopped no matter what and, and you know, trying to have a straight thought and it's, like plan accordingly is see, tough when you're it's that what angry. W- it's what we in the wrestling business would call cheap hate. <laughs> yeah. Um, what so for me, like the thing, I, I again, I always fall in this trap where I just I want to write these scenes, I want to rewrite the movie, uh, because I know what I, I know how I want the story beats to go. Um, and I would have really, would have really worked for me. Um, would be if they did like a parallel scene. So they, I definitely keep that in. I definitely want that to keep it in. I would want them to put that climactic scene in parallel with that scene where they're all seeing the data come back, right? Because that's that's the end of him being injured and unconscious, right? That's coming into him waking up. Yeah, I don't, right. Well, so, I don't remember. It I kind thought of that an, was around the same time. No, he's he's having this. That's the that's the thing. That's what gets me. That's why I'm like, this doesn't work for me. Is he has that uh, the end of his flashback, the end of his arc, uh, as they're landing on Counter Earth. Yeah. And then they have like the whole Counter Earth scenes, and then they bring him back, um, and that's like, I want to. I just want to take out that and put those two scenes together so that you can have this emotional crescendo that culminates in him waking up and then yeah, you can then you can kind of sublime that like that pain yeah. and, and and emotion into into action i'd rather go into action mm. than into comedy yeah we, we did sit on it i think for a while and um, i think the reason they did that is because if you immediately have him like you know at the at the pearly gates with his other rejected experiments it kind of undercuts the emotion of that scene um i could see that being the justification for why they put it in between they might have put too much stuff and it might have been too totally different which is one of those things that goes back to my point where it feels like the studio is like "Eh, we need to kind of lighten this a little bit um but i'm glad you mentioned kind of rocket being sidelined for most of this movie it's kind of I haven't seen it done a lot before where the character who's having like the origin flashbacks is not a super active participant in like the the current time portion yeah, of the movie. It's kind of the B story in in the in the writing of the movie. His takes the place of the B story, which um having seen it done this way, I understand why it's not done that well. Uh, that often because it it's kind of a difficult task to relate uh what's currently happening to the flashback which is typically when flashbacks are most effective the uh i was gonna say the other famous uh kind of or the other popular uh usage of this technique was um man of steel yeah right where it was it was clark kent's flashbacks to his childhood um that was supposed to be juxtaposed that one. And that one just really didn't work um, because none of the flashbacks tied when they cut from the flashbacks to the, the action that was happening in the present, none of the themes that were expressed in the flashbacks matched up. Were relevant they, they at all, all jumbled yeah. around mm-hmm. like the one where he's supposed to like learn that you should, you know, you're responsible for people's lives. Like remember in, in man of steel where he's like saving the bus Right. It's like you have the choice to help people and kind of expose yourself or live a normal mundane life and, and let tragedy happen. But that's like halfway through the movie <laughs> when the first thing you see adult Clark Kent do in the movie is he's already made the choice to save people and be conspicuous. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, that was that's just the other that's just another instance of them doing it. And that one was not really that was done much worse. Yeah, I'm trying um, to... than this one. I'm trying to think if it was done a different way. Um, 
like to have the flashbacks be different, maybe from the perspective, like, like Rocket telling them, like if he wasn't unconscious throughout, you know, what was pretty much half the movie, more than half the movie, it seemed like. Yeah, he was um, really, he was really out for like the first two acts. I know that was that was what surprised me because I I knew this was gonna be Rocket's like, um, you know, his movie, but I didn't realize like how, um, and. I, I like the story that they told. Maybe the execution maybe was a little, um, you missed a couple beats here and there, but um, I, I'm trying to think of like what else you would have. It didn't go unconscious. Would he be like um, telling them everything, you know, going into those or flashbacks? He could just be having the internal struggle. And yeah. eventually he comes around to the same realization of I'm done running from my past. I'm going to go confront yeah. the demon that's been chasing me. And I feel like it, it connects stronger emotionally if he's a more active participant in the movie. You know, and I bet you there was a version of this that was written where, Ooh. you know, it was him leading the way and confronting that because in the beginning of this movie, we see him kind of like fighting with himself and he does pull out the key card that, you know, right. he remembers and, and you're, you know, us, we're obviously thinking, what is that? But it's obviously something important to him. Um, and, you know, you want to follow that thread, but we get kind of cut off and we don't get that chance. And it just, by happenstance, we have to, by, you know, it, it almost seems like it's a um, ex machina that there's a bomb on his heart that's preventing him from, you know, healing, which has never been the case in the past. This has never, yeah. ever been an issue before. And it's not like but he now, hasn't taken his licks before. Yeah. Now yeah. is the time when we have to go find his you know because that's what i think that's a the it's an aspect i like and i don't like about this movie where i like them trying to have to put together rockets past and trying to figure out you know piecemeal how to how to fix them um mm -hmm. but it is also coincidental and it's like oh it's convenient that also convenient that the thing that killed him you know or you know, try to kill him was you know being the high evolutionaries like thing. Yeah, that's and it was Adam Warlock. That's, what we, and, that's a that's lot what they of called the dramatic irony. Tri yeah, it was a pretty big contrivance to have just Adam Warlock, and he shows up so abruptly. Uh, yeah. There's like almost no explanation, and he's just in the in the fray. And uh, I guess you don't have to explain every little thing. I'm not trying to suggest that, but he's just. Sure. It's just rockets like listfully looking into the night, and then, bam! Cut, smash! Cut the out of warlock flying through space, and then he's he's attacking rocket, and they have their their conflict, and it feels like it's Adam Warlock solely because we set Adam Warlock up in another movie, and we didn't use him for the Thanos story, so we got to figure out something to do with him now, and the the, the tie into the you know the gold people being creations of the high evolutionary is another like we need this to make this thread work i guess the only reason why they, that was a thing was just to be so they would be subservient to high evolutionary um and i'm like that's kind of just random uh because you know they, they seem like they were kind of their own thing beforehand and now they're just like oh we no we actually follow all the orders of this one dude with a weird face yeah who was um, never mentioned before he's a, he's a god though in, yeah. in some corners of the universe yeah. he's a god who he's why gone. haven't people heard of him figured word would get totally around related to everything y'all remember sly stallone's cameo yeah and <laughs> guardians to too deliver, and then uh some chunky sci-fi dialogue you know who's Do, who, who who we should have read this very dense jargony sci-fi speech 76-year-old Sylvester Stallone. <laughs> you know what's even worse is that he actually plays like a like a character that has like a a lore behind him. Uh it it's I don't know. He apparently had a wife as well and one of like his big things of that course. he does is he 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 fuses with his wife and they become one entity and they kind of implied based off his like change in this movie that they already did that just off screen. So I <laughs> I mean, it's hard to hard to evaluate his change when he has like two lines in his cameo in the second one. 
Because the actress, I think, that played his wife in the second one is either... Wait, we saw his wife in the second one? I believe so. Um, I must have not remembered that. That must have just slipped out the side of my brain. Well, it was very fast. Wasn't yeah. very important, I guess. Um, no, I don't think While, while Jake's looking that up, I'll just kind of make quick mention here. Set pieces, lovely, always imaginative. Um, James Gunn has his, you know... Uh, between this and Peacemaker, of course, between this whole series and Peacemaker, you know, he has a deep affinity for the 80s, not just a surface level vaporwave, Stranger Things kind of love. He, yeah. he, he wants to go back to the 80s suburbs <laughs> uh, with, all the, with all the shit that was hanging around. Um, yeah. yeah, but things like the, the, the living flesh planet. Um, I, love, I love myself a good new Phyrexia. <laughs> Yeah, it's um, Michelle Yeoh. That's what it was. Okay, <laughs> she's too she's too big of an actress that to get sounds, for like another. That sounds thing. Marvel, and well, yeah, but that's like the quintessential Marvel of that era. Like any asshole could have done that role, but yeah. they're like, oh, we can get Sly for this. <laughs> and she either has um, another role in the MCU, or she's just too yeah, expensive to I'm get looking. for like uh, another part. Yeah, let me. Um, I'm I'm looking for what um what she was in because I feel like yeah she was, it was yeah she was um uh in Shang Chi. Oh yeah, okay. Yeah, I would check out. She yeah. was uh, Ying, who I think was the the leader of in in the um. Wasn't she like the in Talo? The, yeah, she was like assassin. The, or no, no, you're right. She was the the leader of the the pocket dimension society. Right. Um, yep. So yeah, uh, but getting back to this movie, um, like I said, it's it's not it's of a higher quality than most of Marvel's recent outings. Yeah, CG was really good. I think. I, I, it, yeah, this at was times, a CG fest. At and times, it was, it was good. It wasn't jar- There was only like one. There was only one moment, and it was quick and brief towards the end where all the, the, the monsters were flying out of the ship where it was like CG overload and it was like daggers into my eyes and I'm like, oh, okay, next. Well, I think didn't need this. some of the uh, like the war pig I think looked pretty rough. Um, there there yeah. were certain um, things, but they, they didn't the lean too, too heavily on CGI. Uh, there's a lot of in the movie, obviously. There's two CGI characters. Well, more than that, but there's two in the main cast. Um, but yeah, I just feel like it's it's kind of a little less tonally balanced than the the other two, and it it didn't quite hit the groove of what I liked about the first Guardians movie. I'd say it's better than the second one. Um, I'll give it that. I still think the first one's the best of the bunch. Um, but this isn't like enough to pull me back in. I've kind of been out on the MCU for a while. I'm just kind of waiting for the other two guys here to <laughs> to feel that way, and then we can we can stop reviewing these movies. Um, yeah, we'll we'll see about. I I'm just kind of curious. In a, I'm curious about DC movies and about MCU movies in different ways. Um, just because I want to see how how MCU's. <laughs> I feel like how are they going to get themselves out of this one, um, as they can as they just extend further and further. Um, I would. I want to. Yeah. I just want to see what rabbits they can pull out of a hat. DC uh, movies I watch because I literally have no idea. I'm morbidly what curious. the fuck is going to happen in any given DC movie. <laughs> I'm just so. Is it going to be a a kid friendly, campy kind of um, comedy movie, or is it going to be Joaquin Phoenix's uh, fucking um, Pagliacci, <laughs> the tragedy of Pagliacci, but in Batman world. I uh, yeah, I've never, I've never come away from a DC movie without a strong opinion. So that, there's something to be said for that. Uh, to kind of wrap up my thoughts on this movie, if you are a Guardians of the Galaxy fan and you enjoyed the first two movies, um, I can recommend this one to you, yeah. unless you're someone who's very sensitive to the depictions of cruelty against animals then you might want to set this one out but it is a is a good enough send-off 
for most of the characters, even if some of their like character arcs in this movie were were kind of stunted and and pretty mm-hmm. pretty banal. I feel um, like someone will make an edit that will that will tr- tr- trim out those parts. Um, yeah. But yes, it it we talked a lot about the the story story of this, but as a cap kind of capstone to that that whole series. Um, and you know they tie it up in a, in a nice little bow. You know they give everyone a happy ending, which I think people everyone enjoys a good happy ending. Um, and they gave they gave the fans one more. It was it was kind of like that's the the last fight scene in Endgame where they had the they have the hallway fight against all the creatures, and they said, "All right, guys, here's your last big chunk, your nice chunky." Uh, dose a full swig an entire gallon <laughs> of Guardians fight scene and we're just going to do it as good as we can do it so that you know because you're not going to see these guys all together for a while so uh, leave you out with a bang and that was a very bombastic very highly produced action scene yeah yeah I agree I, I like that that last one um, I, I don't think we're ever going to see them together I think they've confirmed that <coughs> they yeah, are no longer big Dave's out yeah, um, they're all out. Chris Pratt's out. No, the <laughs> Star Lord will return. That was at the end of the last post credit scene. Oh, was oh I didn't. Yeah, because I, I Kurt and I were joking like he's back on. He came back on Earth just in time for Secret Invasion. Okay. Um. All right. Never mind. I stand corrected. Uh. Okay. Well, then the last time I think we're gonna see them. As a majority, yeah, no. The the majority of the group, their deals are up. Maybe they'll Um, come back and kind of say hi to each other during the next climax phase movie. You know, it'll be one of those. But otherwise, no, I agree. Like the other thing was, Sean Gunn is still in like that end credit group. uh, You know, saying, "Oh, I'm still a part of the Guardians." Um, Is he going to continue doing that role if James Gunn's on the project or is he, I guess he's his own person. He can do what he wants. But... Yeah, I would say, I hope they have, um, you know, some it's going to be wild to see. It's going to be a minute before uh, the guardians are featured in another movie. Yeah. Like, phase five. Sure. We have like movie wise, we have uh, the Marvel's um, blade, which I believe is going to be pushed off again. Um, Bring back Wesley Snipes. And, uh, Captain America New World Order are like the next three movies that we're going to get. There's a lot of shows interspaced between there that yeah, okay. I... You know, it's... Daredevil Born Again is the only one that I think is worth the, probably The two seeing. Marvel projects I'm excited for are Daredevil Born Again, uh, which I'm also kind of nervous for because I the, the Netflix show was so good and <laughs> I, I worry. It's, a, it's your darling kind of mess with success there and x-men 97 those are the two marvel projects that i'm actually anxiously awaiting um yeah i think it's gonna be a while until we actually get something worthwhile watching um secret invasion might be nice but you know i'm not interested in echo loki season two maybe but i don't think it's gonna be amazing i don't think blade's gonna be good I don't think Agatha Coven of Chaos is going to be any good. <laughs> That's got very little shot of being great. <laughs> I can't. I, I mean, Thunderbolts, cool idea. Didn't they, they pull it off? I swear to God they did a Thunderbolts TV show on, like, ABC, and it ran, like, half a season. <laughs> I'm not sure. I mean, Or at least yeah. the teleporting dog from Thunderbolts was in the show. They did in Humans. They yeah, in Humans. Show. In, but he, in Humans ran for a while. And that was connected to the MCU for a while as well. Maybe I often get the Thunderbolts and Inhumans mixed up. So yeah, no, Inhumans had like the, five seasons. Maybe it's because the Inhumans have Black Bolt. Yeah, that's but that's a me connection. That's the five. That's the mental bridge. I would. Well, I'm, so, that so, shit. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I said Inhumans. I meant to say um, the other one. Um, <laughs> right. It wasn't called Inhumans, right? It was. Uh, it's Marvel's The Inhumans, one season, twenty seventeen. Yeah. So Agents of Shield ran for a while. That, that's the one. That's the one. I'm sorry. Agents <laughs> of Shield. That one was more connected to the. Did the, did the Thunderbolts team. show up in that one? Because I know that had some unique villains. They had like Graviton Probably. and like the Frost Giants. Yeah, I never watched Agents of Shield, but I there I knew people who liked it. They, 
I watched the first couple seasons. I thought it was pretty good until they jumped the shark and they got real weird with it, which probably isn't any different than what we're at now at this point with like the Cree and yeah. shit. Um, but yeah, I guess that's uh, that's Gog three. Um, we'll be back next week with some. There's some movie coming out next week, I'm sure. Oh yeah. Um, if nothing else, we'll watch that Saint Seiya movie. <laughs> <laughs> we'll watch yeah. Zodiac. What was it? Zodiac Z- Nights. Zodiac. Having Nights, no yeah. experience with Saint Seiya. Yeah, we're yeah, just gonna yeah. we're just gonna watch it blind and go. Oh no! <laughs> I can fast. still smell the disappointment in the fans. I don't remember <laughs> this season of Power Rangers. <laughs> yeah. I think Fast X comes out soon. Oh right, yeah, that is. I also I am also tempted to watch that with no context. I have I have a morbid movie. curiosity to see what. A modern Fast and the Furious movie looks yes, like. Yes, comes out next week on the nineteenth. So, so, so maybe we'll it. maybe we'll review Fast X. We'll we'll we'll, we'll discuss amongst ourselves. We'll see. <laughs> but, but whatever it is, you'll get it on the next episode. Yep. So until then, be well, stay safe, and party like it's nineteen ninety five. Peace. Bye bye. <laughs>